Hai già cominciato? No. Okay, I'm going to pull on. So, welcome. We start the second uh, day afternoon session with the second lecture by Augusto Sagnotti. Thank you very much. Just, uh, I want to start, uh, I will go very quickly to a brief review of uh, some important aspects of string theory, but I would like to start uh, by reminding you some uh, points uh, that I discussed yesterday and uh, also conclude a little bit the discussion because I, uh, I speed it up at the end, uh, so maybe it's better to take it back. Uh, so I made some uh, redefinitions. This is the redefinition of uh, the scalar field. So uh, the exponent that I'm playing with is 2 times this gamma times phi. I can do it again, OK? So let me do it on this side, OK? So the, the equation that I, I discussed uh, is this one. This is the standard equation of cosmology for a scalar minimally coupled to gravity, but in an unusual gauge and with some redefinitions that make uh, the discussion dimension independent. The redefinitions are the following. This quantity A is, di this quantity curly A is D minus 1 times the standard A. The metric is And uh, the scalar field uh, is such that uh, I write it in this form because it's interesting to compare with something that we will get to. So in particular, to be explicit, uh, gamma equal 1 in d equal 10 will correspond to an exponent, which is e to the 3 halves uh, times the conventionally normalized uh, scalar field. So what I showed you yesterday is that by considering this equation in the vicinity of the initial singularity, where phi dot is large, <coughs> and looking for solutions that asymptotically behave like a constant divided by tau, then we got an equation for c which was the following, was minus c plus c. c actually, let me, let me continue to write it here so that uh, the small part there disappears. The equation for c that we got near the initial singularity was the following, was minus c plus c absolute value of c plus gamma c squared equals 0. <coughs> the solution of this equation, if I divide by c and I define... Uh, and I define c to be epsilon times the absolute value of c, the solution takes the following form. Absolute value of c equal 1 divided by 1 plus epsilon gamma, which clearly makes sense only if epsilon equal 1, which means that c is positive if gamma is larger than or equal to 1. And it makes sense for both choices if uh, <coughs> gamma is less than 1. The interpretation of this phenomenon was the existence of two types of solutions in not too steep uh, potentials. The descending solution, whereby the, the scalar field starts from here, decelerates, so for gamma less than 1, decelerates and eventually attains the limiting speed, phi dot equal minus gamma over square root of 1 minus gamma squared. And the second solution in which the scalar climbs and then as I turn around, uh, goes down and attains the same limiting speed uh, here from lower values and here from higher values. 
Now, a system of this type uh, is, uh, and then I showed you that uh, the subtlety do, uh, that uh, leads effectively to the existence of two solutions is very simple. It comes from the fact that you have an absolute value in a certain solution, which separates the two branches in which that variable w is positive or negative. And w meant essentially the difference uh, between this speed and the limiting speed. So it was positive in, if you were approaching it from below and negative uh, otherwise. This was separating the two solutions. If one repeats the exercise that I did yesterday for gamma larger than one, uh, one ends up uh, with the inverse uh, trigonometric functions, and then there is no distinction. There is only one class of solutions because the denominator doesn't have this negative uh, uh, sign, and therefore you never run into the issue of the absolute value of the logarithm. However, this is a model that is uh, at most suggestive. It's telling you that there is the possibility of learning something from this system far away from the range that has been uh, investigated in detail in connection with uh, inflationary cosmology, in a range in which gamma is large and therefore slow roll never attains. However, for the kind of uh, situations that I will uh, try to call to your attention, what I have in mind is to integrate this potential, to complete it, uh, by the addition of other terms uh, on which we have some uh, indirect ways of uh, uh, saying something, as you will see later in the last lecture, some other terms which are milder. And now the idea would be that if you have a potential that combines a steep term of this type with a mild one, the steep term forces the climbing, so forces the scalar to go up, and if you want to charge it uh, with potential energy, and uh, as the potential energy is released, uh, the scalar starts to go down fast and then slowly decelerates, attains slow roll in the, in the uh, corresponding semi-plateau. So if you want, uh, we are investigating a type of mechanism that could describe the onset of inflation. Now, I want to conclude this first part. I'm extending a little bit uh, beyond what I wanted to do originally by showing you an example of a potential which is more complicated than this. It can be solved exactly because I, I was privileged to work with an expert on integrable models uh, at some point, uh, Sasha Sorin, and with a colleague in uh, Torino, Pietro Fre. So we wrote one paper where there is a a solution of uh, many classes of integrable models uh, of increasing sophistication that uh, embody the climbing phenomenon. So I will show you only the simplest one. The simplest one because it's very instructive, it's simple, and then you will see the reason of what's going on. So the potential I will consider will be the combination of two terms. And I, without any loss of uh, generality, I will restrict gamma to be less than one, actually between zero and one. You see that the potential of this type uh, for gamma less than one has a steep term and a mild term. And now I will show you, at least give you a hint, uh, of how, how the system can be solved uh, exactly and how the corresponding behavior embodies precisely the type of dynamics that I have in mind. Fast uh, roll the reach of a turning point, beginning of a fast descent, slow down, and attaint of, a, of an attractor uh, behavior, which is driven purely by the mild potential. So if gamma is less than one by this term. So the idea is to write down the Lagrangian, the action principle that we wrote down last time. And the action principle, in terms of these reduced variables, uh, if I recall uh, my conventions correctly, had this form. Now there is a nice trick uh, to solve this system if one works uh, in the conformal gauge. Because if you work in the conformal gauge, which corresponds to the choice B equal A, the script A rather, this term, then, uh, and uh, you should also recall, uh, <coughs> we should also recall that this system uh, through the equation of B gives you the Hamiltonian constraint. Uh, So 
So if you go to this uh, conformal gauge, uh, then the Lagrangian takes uh, a form which is very suggestive. Actually, let me write it like this. Now you see that uh, the kinetic term for this system is formally Lorentz invariant. So I can perform a boost that makes it, uh, leaves it in the same form in terms of some variables which I will call hatted variables. And uh, I can use the boost in order to assign these two terms respectively to one and the other of these variables. So in other words, let me write, for instance, this, uh, this term larger here so you appreciate better what I'm doing. I'm supposing that gamma is less than 1. So this term I will write it as like this. And then the other term I could write it as e to the 2 square root of 1 over gamma squared minus 1 times 5 plus gamma a over square root of 1 minus gamma squared. Now you see that there is nothing that uh, forbids me to call this quantity a hat and to call this quantity phi hat. This is the very simplest uh, model of this class. There are many tricks to, to solve these systems uh, in, with more complicated potentials, but they all boil down to the same story. This is the simplest uh, case in which I can illustrate it. So if I do this, uh, then uh, the Lagrangian becomes separable. And then if you write down the equations uh, for phi hat and a hat, uh, they have two separate uh, energy conservation equations. There's two, first, uh, two independent first uh, integral of motion. And uh, the corresponding constants uh, are subject to a constraint because you have to satisfy this condition. Lo and behold, you go to the end. Uh, and uh, the exact solution of this system which I must have somewhere here, I hope. Otherwise, I will show it to you later. No, but they must be here. The exact solution of this system has a relatively simple form and contains precise, embodies precisely the phenomenon I told you about. So, for instance, the solution for A is e to the A equal e to the A0 times the ratio of two hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic cosine of a certain variable omega, which I define slightly below, t times a certain characteristic time, which, uh, if you want, uh, uh, defines the impact of the scalar, how, how hard is the impact of the scalar with the very steep potential. This whole, this whole expression is raised to the 1 over 1 minus gamma squared. And the denominator is hyperbolic sine of omega uh, gamma t. And uh, the scalar field uh, is given by this expression. Now this is omega. And this is omega gamma t minus t phi. And all these things is raised to the gamma over 1 minus gamma squared. And omega squared is a function of the strength of the potential and the only initial condition that we have in the, in the game. There would be two initial conditions, but they are related by, for the sake of comparison, 
if you want uh, to solve uh, the simplest model with a simple exponential potential, then uh, in that case, the climbing scalar, which is an option there, the climbing scalar is also given in terms of uh, trigonometric, uh, actually hyperbolic functions in that case. The difference is that, uh, so here is the solution. The climbing scalar is this, phi dot equal one half times square root of one minus gamma over one plus gamma, hyperbolic cotangent. Now of tau over two square root of one minus gamma squared minus the, the ratio the other way around hyperbolic tangent of tau over 2 square root of 1 minus gamma squared. What you learn from this solution is that um, in this case, uh, the scalar moves up. So if I look at phi as a function of tau, here what happens for gamma uh, less than 1 is that there are two options. In the interesting, uh, but, uh, but in this kind of uh, option, what happens is that the scalar in terms of tau goes like this and then attains, in terms of this variable, this negative constant speed. Remember that phi dot tends to a negative value in this system of coordinates. In the limiting uh, case, uh, when gamma goes to 1, then uh, we get precisely to this linearly accelerated motion, because in this case, phi dot becomes exactly solved by y minus tau tau, uh, tau, uh, to tau minus tau over 2. You see that uh, for large enough tau, you get a linear term in, the, in phi dot. Sorry, again. So for gamma equal 1, we get precisely this behavior that we sort of identify by the toy example of classical mechanics. When tau, there is a turning point at tau equal 1, and for tau large enough, there is a linear behavior. There's no attractor anymore. The scalar has linear uh, growth of the speed. So you get uniform acceleration. This model, has, uh, this model here combines both features. Because what happens here is that you have climbing uh, necessarily. And if you want, the necessity of climbing has to do with the form of the potential here. You see that uh, you can see it uh, essentially by inspection when you rotate uh, the, the two terms. Well, because one of these terms uh, has a kinetic term which is positive and a potential which is negative. Say that I rotate this thing to be phi hat. Then clearly, when uh, this variable grows, uh, no matter what initial kinetic energy you have, you cannot grow. So the barrier comes from this positive potential. For A, you have a different situation because the kinetic term of A is negative. So the climbing in this case is due to the barrier that cannot be overcome by any kind of kinetic energy. So in this case, what happens if you combine two, the two things? Now I'm working in terms of uh, conformal time, so the behavior is different. In conformal time, the limiting behavior becomes logarithmic. So you have a behavior like this in terms of eta. So eta goes to zero at uh, large enough uh, time there. But the important thing is that in this case, the option of going up and then going down is absolutely forced on you. You have no other choice. So now I will leave uh, this example because I will try to give you a quick review of string theory, or some aspects of, uh, of string theory, that eventually will explain to us why we can predict exactly these coefficients. So one of the few things that you can predict exactly from string theory, if you want, uh, unmistakably, is these numbers. And the reason is that they come from some topological uh, facts uh, of two-dimensional Riemann surfaces. So let me start to uh, review for you qualitatively some aspects of string theory. First of all, when you hear experts uh, coming to talk to you about string theory, they talk uh, about string theory as a theory of gravity. But as you may know, string theory had a very different origin. It basically was invented by chance, by Veneziano, who discovered the important role of a special amplitude 
which was uh, essentially present in, uh, in classic text of mathematics because it involves the gamma function of Euler or if you want a beta function of Euler, a combination thereof. So the Venetian amplitude was invented in 1968 So this is Veneziano 1968. And then, uh, shortly, there, shortly after this, uh, there was another amplitude more complicated that I will not show you, that was invented by Shapiro and Virasoro. And uh, in modern terms, uh, this amplitude uh, describes uh, the scattering uh, of four excitations of open strings. So I have four particles that come inside here. Say, let me take all the momenta entering. Uh, no, maybe this one, I take them out. P3 and P4, let me use this definition. So do you have two particles entering momenta with momenta P1, P2, two particles going out with P3 and P4, momentum conservation, which forces P1 plus P2 equal P3 plus P4. And, uh, and people in the 1960s were looking uh, at amplitudes uh, which were reflecting uh, something that in hadronic physics people had noticed, uh, the existence of linear rigid trajectories. So if you look at the hadronic spectrum, there is a regularity in which the squared mass of hadronic resonances and uh, the spin, if you plot these points corresponding to the resonances in a plane, this point dispose themselves more or less along linear trajectories. This amplitude here contains uh, immediately the property of uh, linearly rising trajectories for a reason that I will be able to show you. But it also contains another remarkable feature, the fact that the fixed angle high energy scattering, in this case, goes to zero exponentially. This was the death of string theory in the 70s, because people had started uh, to study in detail deep inelastic scattering, and they wanted power-like behavior of cross-sections. No. Yes, I'm going to describe, define them in a minute. So I will show you, or at least hint, uh, to these two properties on the basis of two famous properties of the gamma function. So as Hugo reminded me, S, T, and U are the three Mandelstam variables. So S is essentially the center of mass energy. T is a quantity that uh, relates to the scattering amplitude, the scattering angle and the energy. And U is the other variable. They are not independent because you can show that S plus T plus U is in general the sum of the masses squared. And since the particle at stake here is the same, so you get, you get four times the square mass of this particle. So there are two properties of the gamma function that are very important. The first one is that in the whole complex plane, gamma of z plus one is z gamma of z. And this property has an important consequence if one specializes this uh, expression to the integer positive numbers. This implies uh, by iteration that gamma of n plus one is n factorial. If you want the second property of the gamma is that for real part of z positive, gamma has a simple integral representation. It's essentially a Laplace transform, if you want, of a power. The other property of gamma that you can already see extending this relation to the left-handed portion of the complex plane and working backwards. The other property of gamma is that it has an infinite number of poles uh, along the real axis with residues uh, which go with oscillatory signs like minus one to the n over n factorial. So in detail, the property is that gamma of z behaves like minus one to the n over n factorial, one over z plus n when z approaches minus n. Then there is another property of gamma that I will remind you immediately now, which is called the Stirling formula. It's very important in statistical mechanics. 
And this formula tells you how gamma behaves uh, in the complex plane outside the little wedge uh, along the negative real axis. And the, the formula goes like this, that gamma of z, if you go away from the origin in that sense, behaves like square root of 2 pi z to the, actually, let me, call, let me write gamma of z plus 1 z to the z plus 1 half e to the minus z. Now I'll do something simple that we can do on the blackboard. I want to show you uh, the key property of the gamma function, that if I look in the neighborhood of the pole, first of all, let's look at the poles, actually. Let's see what kind of particles we are describing. The idea is that we are imitating what you do in field theory. If you, do what you, if you compute a diagram like this in field theory, and actually with scalar external particles, then uh, you will have some exchange particle in the middle, and then you will have some propagators, so we can look at the poles, uh, and from the poles we can read the masses of the particles. We can read the masses of the particles which are exchanged. I'm really sorry I cannot uh, adapt the size. So this is the kind of situation that we have. In field theory, if you looked at the poles uh, of an amplitude, then you could know what kind of particles are interchanged. So let's look at the pole of this amplitude. Well, we have a, a pole. Uh, first of all, we have poles at all the negative integers. So where are these poles? They are at minus 1, minus alpha prime s, equal minus n. So s, which is the center of mass energy, is 1 over alpha prime times n minus 1. n is an integer. And insofar as n is equal to 1, 2, 3, or so on, we are all OK. The big problem with the Veneziano model, which is a problem after essentially 50 years, is the fact that there's actually, by consistency, one state where s is negative. A state of this type has negative mass squared, which is a, is a tachyon. So it means that this model, we only control it around the wrong vacuum. For experts, uh, there are two cases, actually. There are troubles of this type uh, coming from the open sector and troubles of this type coming from the closed sector. For the open sector, we have a better control. Essentially, they come from extended objects, generalized solitons which decay. For the closed tachyon, we don't really know how to handle it. But somehow we have a problem. However, let's look at the generic... Uh, generic uh, uh, Paul, well, then this amplitude behaves uh, from the first factor, like minus 1 to the n uh, over, <coughs> you see, you get uh, minus 1 minus alpha prime s plus n times n factorial. This is the limiting behavior of this quantity. And then uh, here, instead of alpha prime s, uh, or if you want, of minus 1 minus alpha prime s, I can put minus n. So this expression becomes minus 1 minus alpha prime t, and below you get minus n minus alpha prime t. Sorry? Alpha prime so far is just a, a, a number, so, sorry, actually a number, a dimensionful number, which serves uh, to make this quantity dimensionless. Yeah? So it's a scale. Now, you can see that it's also the scale of the massive excitations. Right? Real, shortly, you will see what it is in terms of microscopic quantities. Now, the only thing I wanted to call your attention to is that if you start using uh, this equation recursively here, then you discover that this quantity is a polynomial of degree n in t. And for those who are familiar with these facts, uh, the degree of the polynomial indicates the spin of the interchange particle. Actually, it's not just e to the n. It's a polynomial which contains the highest power and the lower ones. So which means uh, that at a certain mass level, you have various regge trajectories that go through. But in general, at the nth pole, you go up to spin n. So the theory is really an extremely complicated uh, model. You have infinitely many states in this model, 
And uh, the infinitely many states uh, include an infinity of states of higher spin. And if you know a little bit about the problems in quantum field theory, the higher spins are a frontier. And in this case, they work uh, nicely because they are massive. But if you try to go to the massless limits of these uh, higher spin fields, you have a lot, lots of problems that are still open for the community. The other problem is, the other uh, limit is a little bit trickier to, to work out. Uh, but roughly speaking, you can see it from here. You see that uh, if you go to the limit, uh, at least you can get a glimpse from there. So if I go to the limit uh, of high energy and fixed angle, actually, to begin with, if I go to the limit of high energy and vanishing angle, that is the reg limit. In this case, you can see that this uh, expression here behaves like uh, powers, algebraic powers of the variables. But the most interesting case is when you go to fixed angle high energy. In this case, S and T go simultaneously to infinity. And what happens due to this behavior of the gamma function is that this amplitude in this limit behaves like e to the minus some coefficient, which depends on alpha, which is proportional to alpha prime times s. So an amplitude like this is essentially zero when s is of order one over alpha prime. That is the, that's the lesson. And that's why people got desperate in the, in the early 70s with string theory, because alpha prime was set at the time at the scale of uh, hadronic resonances. So what happened uh, is that uh, the prediction of this model, independently even of this uh, question of the tachyon and of another more uh, puzzling question that will uh, be raised shortly, this amplitude was essentially zero at the energies of interest for hadronic scattering. So the model was not working uh, altogether. However, the model has a peculiar uh, property. So if you take this amplitude, this uh, result at face value, you see that, of course, you have uh, this very disturbing tachyonic excitation. But you also have an excitation for n equal 1, which corresponds to vanishing mass. So in other words, uh, this infinite spectrum contains a particle which is to some extent akin to a photon, capable of producing large uh, distance electromagnetic effects. Now, I cannot repeat the other computation because it's harder, but you will see some uh, aspects of it in my flashes in the, in the following, that if you repeated the same computation for the shapiro Virasoro amplitude, which is roughly speaking a square of this quantity, then you would discover a similar mass spectrum, a similar mass spectrum. Oh, sorry, why, why do I say that this is a photon? The reason is precisely this. Because the residue, the first residue, is linear in T. And I told you that the power of T indicates the spin of the interchange particle. So the lowest uh, particle has no powers on T, and it's a scalar. It's what is called the tachyon of the Veneziano model. The next particle is, uh, has an interchange which is linear in T, and then it's a photon, and so on and so forth. For the shapiro virasoro model, you would obtain a mass formula which is similar to this one, and would be like this, 4 over alpha prime times n minus 1. And in that case, uh, since the formula is a square of this one, uh, essentially, you can anticipate that the linear power of T becomes a quadratic power. So the massless state, in this case, has spin 2. So the model contains a spin 2 particle. People took a long time to come to terms with this story. And coming to terms with this story was uh, a main achievement of three people in the mid-70s, which were Scherk and Schwartz. And independently, a Japanese, Yoneya. So we are talking about 1974. Not only they discovered this thing, and, they, and actually they took it seriously, but they understood uh, that gravity gives an enormous freedom to deal with another problem of this model. So let me come to the next problem of this model. I, I will be slightly anti-historical because time is, uh, is short. And uh, to tell you the, some uh, aspects of the real story of the phenomenon, People discovered the Veneziano model in 1968, and it took about two years to realize that what they had discovered was, if you want, an extremely sophisticated uh, 
consequence of the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. Or if you want, uh, they were describing the spectrum of a vibrating string. Then it took many years to come and write down the most convenient action for a vibrating string, uh, which people call the Polyakov action, but it was discovered in the 70s, actually, after the discovery of supergravity by people who were uh, essentially supergravity experts. Uh, Deser and Zumino and Brink, Divec, and Howe. Then Polyakov went much further. He quantized this action and discovered uh, this funny property that I will tell you about uh, in a modern language. But I will do it in the old language because it's simpler. So what's the action? What is, string, what is the string theory action? The string theory action takes the following form. And it's a generalization of the particle action takes the following form. So I'm, I will write it in, in its Minkowski version, although so this is the string action. One important property of the string action that you may notice <coughs> is that if I, if I scale the metric by a certain factor, then the square root of the determinant scales by the same factor, because it would scale like the square, the determinant is 2 by 2, but the square root scales by like that. And then the inverse scales like 1 over omega squared. So this means that this action is classically invariant under binary scalings. No, this is the Polyakov action. The number of action obtains from this one if you eliminate gamma. You can eliminate, this is a Lagrange multiplier. If you eliminate it, you get the number of geometric action in terms of the, of the of the area. However, you don't need to be an expert in string theory. We are, we are among gravity experts. What is this thing? It's a theory of scalar fields coupled to gravity in two dimensions. So the first thing you notice is that there is something missing. I didn't write down an Einstein term. So why didn't I write down an Einstein term? I didn't write an Einstein term because the Einstein term in two dimensions is a total derivative, like we were saying uh, the other day. And actually, to make sense of this total derivative, uh, in better terms, one has to weak rotate and do, do, do things in the Euclidean case. In the Euclidean case, what happens is that this surface that is swept by the string becomes a Riemann surface. A Riemann surface is compact. You can compute the total curvature the, of the Riemann surface. So let me, let me go. If I go Euclidean, to be really precise, if I go Euclidean, the missing term, the Einstein term that I didn't write down, is this thing. But uh, this term here, if I, if I divide it, say, by 4 pi, since the curvature is a, is a factor of 2 divided by the radius square of a sphere, say, and the area of a sphere is 4 pi squared, this quantity for a sphere is equal to 2. In general, if you repeat this computation for higher genus Riemann surfaces, which are, say, start from the sphere, then you go to the torus, which contain, has one handle, double torus, and so on and so forth, which you may see all this stuff uh, that I'm picturing has the flavor of a perturbative uh, Feynman-like expansion, where instead of having particles running in loops, you have strings. Well, for all these cases, this quantity is simply 2 minus twice the number of handles, where the handles are these uh, structures on the surface. So you say, OK, this is not uh, a big deal. I ignore it. It's a number. But, but there is an interesting fact. And before solving this uh, theory in flat space, uh, I want to uh, describe to you this fact. The fact is that this theory has something very intriguing. Here you get the space-time uh, Minkowski metric. So this immediately suggests a generalization. If you want to get uh, this theory to describe a string, uh, moving in an arbitrary space-time, how ambitious, right? We cannot understand uh, the theory in flat space because it has a tag, and we even put it in curved space-time. But suppose you do that. Then what would you put here? You would put here the metric. And what is this thing with a generic metric? This is what is called uh, a nonlinear sigma model.
In a linear sigma model, in general, has quantum corrections, which are non-trivial. And then the original violin invariance that you have inside, you have, to, you have to think about it, right? Because if you compute the quantum correction of this system, you better go to two minus epsilon dimensions, for instance, if you want to use dimensional regularization. If I go to two minus epsilon dimensions, this constellation doesn't hold anymore. So this means that if I compute the quantum corrections, then I get uh, some effective dependence on the scale. And I may ask uh, if I have some conditions whereby this dependence cancels. So if you want, if conformal invariance can be maintained at the quantum level. And guess what this condition will be? This is one of the most remarkable successes of string theory. The condition is that this quantity here gives the possibility of building a Ricci tensor. And the condition for conformal invariance is that the Ricci tensor vanishes. So in other words, the vacuum Einstein equation is a consequence of the consistency condition of this model at the one loop level in the world sheet. But of course, if you do this computation of the world sheet at the one loop level, you may also do it at the two loop and three loop and so on and so forth. So the theory is not uh, telling you that Darmian nu is zero, but the Darmian nu is uh, something of order R squared. And what is the scale that connects these two is this scale here, which is called the string tension. So you don't discover Einstein's equation, but you discover Einstein's equation plus an infinite number of corrections that become important in regions, this hints to what I was saying last time, where this curvature is somehow small with respect to the typical scale of the string, which is set by this alpha prime. One over alpha prime is essentially what is called the string tension. Alpha prime has dimension of length squared. The inverse of alpha prime is a curvature. And then you have to compare curvatures with this quantity. So if you want, uh, whenever alpha prime times the curvature of your region is much smaller than one, then you are effectively recovering Einstein's equations. Now I come to the second term before solving this thing. And I say the second term is irrelevant. No, it's not irrelevant. It's very important. And the reason is the following. That if you add the second term, you may conceive a modification of the second term similar to the previous one, introducing a scalar field inside the integral. If I introduce a scalar field inside the integral, then the integral is not trivial anymore. Because this is a total derivative, but I can reshuffle the total derivative on top of the scalar field. Not only, this term is already not vile invariant by itself. I say, okay, then I shouldn't add it. No, because somehow, since alpha prime plays the role of h bar in this expression, it's, it's, it's as though this term was uh, effectively a one-loop contribution added to that one. So in other words, the violation of conformal invariance that you get at one loop from this term, where alpha prime, which plays the role of h bar in this expansion, disappears, it has the same order of the three-level variation of this one. Lo and behold, when you put all these terms together, you discover that the equation of motion that uh, embody the conformal invariance, which means the consistency condition of this thing, come from an action principle. And the action principle takes the following form. Actually, I forgot the crucial factor. Plus dot, 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 because the other terms are not taken into account. For instance, there is another term that one can add here, which is like a Vesumino term, for those who know what I'm talking about, which involves uh, the, <coughs> the gauge field of a three form. And it's not a coincidence, because in some sense, that uh, two form stands to the string like uh, the vector potential, a mu, stands to a particle. So the string is charged with respect to this. Uh, this field. And now you get this uh, effective action. Notice that I did it for generic D, because eventually we will use it for D equal 10, because D equal 10 is the only case in which we have some minimal control of the dynamics. D equal 26, uh, there are even people, very smart ones, including Angler and collaborators, that have thought uh, that maybe the simplicity of the two-dimensional dynamics, where Fermi and Bose excitations are essentially equivalent, uh, could perhaps justify a link between the string theory in 26 dimensions and the ones in 10. This was never quantified because the vacuum is not under control. 
But in principle, it could even be that at some point these arguments are made precise, and we realize that the string in 26 dimensions is the same thing as the strings in 10 in some regime. Not solid because of this problem, but it's a very interesting idea. So now we go <clears throat> to the simplest case. Now I told you the relation with this thing. Actually, I can do one last, one uh, next step. And uh, I this I can do it uh, qualitatively. Now, if I expand, uh, and in my expansion I use a sphere, I told you that this thing uh, contains, uh, a, gives an Euler character, which is 2. And notice that the Euler character, which is 2, is uh, sitting here in this exponent. But if in my theory I also allow disks, uh, since a disk is doubly covered by a sphere, you will not be surprised uh, to know that the disk will give you an Euler character, which is half of that of the sphere. So if I add disks uh, in this perturbative expansion, generically, generically, I will also have other terms, uh, including this very simple one, which contain uh, odd powers of the exponential of minus phi. OK? You agree? So let me now do an exercise. This is called the string frame presentation. Now let me do a virus scaling, similar to what I was doing in two dimensions, but now in d dimensions. And I go to the Einstein frame, because we like to think about Einstein's theory by itself, without scalars uh, polluting it on the, on the side. So let's do this virus scaling. And the question I will ask is, what is this exponent here, if I do the virus scaling? Notice that it's precisely determined, right? Because this thing is the Euler character of the disk, which is half of the Euler character of the sphere, and so on and so forth. And I justified, more or less, to you the necessity, the need for introducing this term, and the fact that without or with phi equal constant, uh, which means up to derivatives of phi, which are not present in the exponent, the meaning of this term is topological. So if I take out the average of phi, this becomes a, an integer number. Okay? So let me do the phi rescaling. So I will uh, do the following. I take the metric, and I let the metric become the Einstein uh, frame metric times some coefficient e to the alpha phi. Well, you know that we produce a mess because of the, of the R term. But let's assume that phi is constant, because all we need is the exponents. The rest, uh, you have to take my word and uh, Believe me that at some point we will get to modify this kinetic term. Notice that this kinetic term is tachyon-like. Ghost-like, rather, sorry. Should be a minus sign in my convention. I'm working with minus plus, plus, plus. Einstein, for me, is minus because I learned uh, generatively long ago from Weinberg's book, uh, who uses a funny convention in which the sphere has negative curvature. So that's why there is this minus sign. It's a bit perverse, but uh, anyway, you can do it. Now, this is... Uh, as a wrong sign, as a kinetic term. If you perform this virus scaling, you have to believe me that this sign changes. Okay? But let's do it for phi constant, so we can really follow the steps. So what do we get here? And let me do it in 10 dimensions, for a reason that uh, will become interesting later. So if d is equal to 10, what do I get here? You get uh, e to the 5 alpha, right? Because it will be to the 10, but then there is a square root. So you get e to the 5 alpha phi. Let's see if I can do the computation correctly. Then you get uh, minus 2 phi, which was already there. And then you have to recall that the Ricci scalar contains an inverse metric, because the, the Ricci tensor has no net power of the metric. So it means that if you do this kind of thing, you must get uh, minus alpha phi. So if I did things correctly, 5 minus 1 is 4, which means that alpha, you should take it equal to 1 half. So if you do, the, if you do this transformation with alpha equal 1 half, in the 10-dimensional case that uh, I will advocate to your attention, then this term becomes standard Einstein. The derivative is rearranged. Never mind. Look, let's look at this term. Well, this term, uh, you, you get uh, 5 over 2, because alpha is 1 half, minus 1. So the result of that term is e to the 3 halves phi. Now I go to my formulas that fortunately are there. 
So I go to 10 dimensions. D equal 10, this is 9, 8 divided by 2 is 4. In 10 dimensions, this is e to the 3 halves gamma phi. So the topological expansion implies that the scalar field, if we take seriously that potential, is indeed gamma equal 1, which is the reason why I entertained you with the exercise of last lecture. So somehow this simple dynamical problem is telling us something very basic about string theory. Of course, what, whatever very basic you can get from a top-down perspective, because the rest is completely model-dependent, depends on the dynamics. You have no prediction of these things. String, string theory is well known for being unpredictable. Right? But this thing, if we look at the right uh, you know, direction, we, de we do learn something. That gamma equal 1 is precisely the case of interest. Now, before concluding the lecture, I have how much? 10. ten. So in 10 minutes, I will try to give you an idea of how you get out of this uh, action principle in flat space, uh, when we can solve it uh, precisely, the famous spectrum of the Veneziano model. And the, there are two steps. First of all, in two dimensions, I can always uh, choose locally a metric which is conformally flat. But given this rescaling property, a metric which is conformally flat is a metric which is flat, effectively. Right? Because if I, if I take uh, gamma AB equal omega squared, say, eta AB, that's equivalent to removing omega squared and putting it equal to 1. You pay no price because the omega squared cancels. And then uh, you will allow me that if all the metric disappears, uh, this becomes the string theory that you teach in class to second year students, uh, so you should be able to solve it, right? The equation for this string theory is the second derivative with respect to tau minus the second derivative with respect to sigma of x mu equals zero. And we know how to solve this thing, right? Classically, it's a, it's a Fourier series. So imagine, <laughs> I'm coming to that, that's the complication. <laughs> Very good, so I cannot cheat to go. <laughs> So what is the constraint? It's what you could call the Hamiltonian constraint, or if you want, it's the condition that comes from the gravity equation. The gravity equation, there's no, there's no kinetic term for gravity, but gravity is sitting here. So the constraint is the condition that the energy momentum tensor of these fields vanish. So the constraint is uh, dA x mu, dB x mu, say eta mu nu, equal one half eta eb dx squared. So you could solve this, uh, this theory up to this point. At this point, this is complicated, especially in the quantum theory, because it's a quadratic condition, so on operators. So people have devised uh, very smart ways to, to solve this thing. And since we know the answer that is correct, done in different ways, I will do it in the most uh, crude and uh, elementary way, so that we get the answer. And first of all, I solve this thing. And so up to the meaning of coefficients, uh, this term, uh, I will try to show you two solutions. What is called the open string solution. And I will use the standard uh, parametrization of this solution, which classically has no special meaning. It starts to have a meaning when I apply quantization to this story. So this is the open. And th that it's the open, you see it, because there's cosines of the derivative. Uh, vanishes at 0 and pi. So I will have this system which is, lives in the 0 pi segment. This will be very important because it will be a Casimir effect very soon. And the Casimir effect will be crucial to have longer distance uh, forces. But next time, probably, because now it's too late to get there. For the closed one, for the closed one, the expansion is slightly different because now you have two types of waves, waves that go say, to the left or to the right, left, left movers or right movers around the closed string. And the parametrization in this case is the following. So there is a crucial difference here, two crucial differences. One I told you, the fact there are two types of waves. And the other one is the, the exponent. So this is the right moving uh, wave, because it moves to the right in the, in the string. And this is the left moving one. Notice the exponent is twice as much. And the reason is that to have periodicity in the length 0 to pi, you have to have even exponents here. And here, you only need you don't want periodicity by 0 derivative. 
the derivative of this is a sine which vanishes at 0 and pi for any n. So now the next question I will address uh, in the five minutes that are left uh, is how you make sense of the constraint. Uh, and the best way to make sense of the constraint uh, is what is called the light cone gauge. So let me try to describe uh, to you the light cone gauge in a, case, in a case which is very familiar, which is electrodynamics. And then we rephrase it in string theory. So in electrodynamics, I have the equation box A mu minus d mu d dot a equals 0. Then I can choose the Lorentz gauge. And then it is convenient to work in a system of coordinates in which the dot product becomes off diagonal. These are the light cone coordinates. So in other words, I write this expression in this form. It's very important to work in this system of coordinates. Because see, in this system of coordinates, you will see that these quadratic constraints will linearize. But in electrodynamics, what do you do? So you fix the light cone gauge, for instance. You put a plus equals 0. And then from this equation, you solve, as a, sorry, you, uh, solve for a minus. You solve for a minus in terms of the other. So formally, a minus is 1 over d plus uh, times uh, d dot a up to sines. So you see, in the light cone gauge, you choose one component, you put it to 0, and you eliminate the other one algebraically up to this uh, non-locality in this p plus variable. In string theory, you can do the same. You see, a priori, you have oscillations in all directions. But somehow, it's a gauge invariant system. It is very close conceptually to a massless system, although it's an extended object. So you fix the light cone gauge, and uh, Fixing the light cone gauge, you put, uh, you see that here you have this alpha n mu for every direction. You put alpha n plus equals 0. So this means uh, you put x plus equal x plus uh, plus 2 alpha prime p plus tau. Then uh, the analog of solving for a minus is that you solve algebraically for the alpha n minus from this constraint. But the, the key point uh, is that. Uh, Actually, there are two key points, because I will use light cone in space time and on the wall sheet. On the wall sheet, what happens is that the metric has only plus minus component in light cone. And I will look at the two independent components, because this thing is traceless. Remember, this equation is traceless. Right? It's, it's a traceless condition. So you don't, you, there, are only, there are only two independent equations. And these two independent equations are the plus plus and the minus minus equation. They look like this in light cone d plus x dot d plus x, where dot is in space time. And the other one is d minus x dot d minus x. For the open string, they are completely equivalent. For the closed string, they are independent. The statement is that uh, these equations, for uh, if you look at these equations, you have infinitely many equations, because I'm applying it to whole Fourier series. If I look at the non-zero modes, <coughs> the statement is that I solve for all the, so these are Fourier series, if I substitute these expressions. So if I look at the n different from 0 modes, I can solve the alpha n minus as in uh, terms of the alpha n i. There's no alpha n plus, because it's 0. If I look at n equals 0, and now we will do it next time, then you will see that we will recover the Veneziano mass formula. So in other words, the, Veneziano, the funny Veneziano mass formula comes from uh, the equations of motion of an extended object that moves, that describes all these infinitely many ISP next citations. I'll finish like this today. Thank you. We'll take time for one of the Please. Can you repeat what Yes, happened? yes, yes. Um. Now, let me, let me do one little computation so you can foresee what I will tell you next time. So let's differentiate this expression here <clears throat> with respect to tau. Let's do the open one, which is simpler. 
If I differentiate with respect to tau, I get 2 alpha prime p mu plus di disappears, and you get square root of 2 alpha prime sum on n different from 0. Alpha n, the 1 over n disappears. If I differentiate with respect to sigma, there's no, contrib no contribution from here, but the cosine becomes minus sine. So you get minus psi square root of 2 alpha prime, sum on n different from 0, same alpha n, either minus psi and tau, sine and sigma. If you sum these two terms, you will see that d sigma plus d tau of x mu is equal to square root of 2 alpha prime, sum on n, different from 0, alpha n, e to the minus i n, tau plus sigma, plus a zero mod term, which I can include. If I define alpha 0 equals square root of 2 alpha prime times p mu. Now, if I substitute this expression in this condition, I will get a quadratic uh, expansion in the alphas. So the generic term here, the coefficient of a certain uh, exponential, will be a sum on k, alpha n minus k, sorry, alpha k minus n, dot alpha n, k, sorry, alpha n minus k dot alpha k. Next time, we will see that uh, this equation can be solved. For n different from 0, it's a linear equation for the alpha n minus. For n equals 0, it's an equation which gives you the mass shell condition. So it gives you the masses of the string excitations. We'll see you tomorrow. Other questions? If not, let's thank August again. And we have a short break of a quarter of an hour. Andava bene o era, era troppo veloce? Eh? Perché in fondo? Perché a livello d'albero è vera, quindi ti chiedi che succede se rimane a essere vera? Ti viene l'equazione di Einstein. Cioè a livello, a livello classico, una proprietà della Lagrangiana, e tu ti chiedi perché succede se la voglio conservare. È una cosa naturale, no? se c'è una simmetria, cioè che succede se la voglio conservare? E ti dà una condizione di autoconsistenza. Remember, you are with a microphone. So. Oh, sorry. It's very...
paciência. Tá, vai. Peraí que eu vou abaixar a tela, tá? Ah, não começa tá agora vai. não, tá bom? Não, não, é, sim, sim. É assim? Ah, sim, sim, acho que funciona. Sim, sim funciona. Ele vai, ele vai baixar a tela e... Ah, sim, 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 sim. Start with the second lecture by Professor Castello Branco on CP violation. So uh, last time I uh, emphasized that uh, in the standard model, the, to study CP violation, uh, one should uh, study the flavor structure of, of the standard model because in the standard model CP is very much connected to that. Okay, and I said that this is need not to be the case in other studies of CP. Violation, but here it, in the standard model is that. So I review them. I'm not going to repeat this, of course. All this, the important points that I want to, to say is that uh, okay, I mentioned that uh, there is even the possibility that was was the first model of uh, CP violation was suggested at the same time as uh, Kobayashi and Maskawa was based not on complex Yukawa coupling but rather on the vacuum having a phase that violates. Uh, CP. This was by T.D. Lee. I will come back to this question later on. Uh, then we we talked about the great success of the standard model. That was really luck in the sense that the standard model is very simple. It could fit all our knowledge previous uh, of uh, charged weak interactions. You know that these are the ones that were known and makes a beautiful prediction about neutral currents. In other words, neutral currents had to exist. The, at least in, 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 the, in the SU2 or SU1. And uh, then, meanwhile, people were very clever to avoid the da great danger of neutral currents, which was the flavor change in neutral currents. You know, I mentioned even, uh, anyway. But, uh, I, I hear an important point that I want to emphasize is that uh, in the standard model, fermion masses, like the quarks and, and the leptons, cannot have a, a bare mass. You cannot write a mass term in the Lagrangian because it's not gauge invariant. And it turns out, just by chance, there was no fundamental principle to tell that it has to be this way, that the same Higgs doublet that gives mass to the Ws and the Zs is the same that can give mass to the fermions. This has not been tested so far to a great extent, you know, because it's very difficult for LHC to see uh, the couplings of the Higgs to the quarks, you know, we only know that it couples to the top, yes, to the bottom also, to the tau, but say for to the electron, for example, uh, we don't know for the up quark, uh, the down, down quark. These are very small couplings that have not been seen experimentally and probably will not be seen. Not if, I'm sure they will not be seen even after the upgrade of LAC. So it means, so, so what? When are you going to see? If you build a new accelerator, it's called ILC, that uh, the uh, you know, linear uh, collider, that, that could maybe measure these quantum. These quantum are fundamental in order to test one of some of the peculiarities of the, of the Higgs mechanism in the standard model, which is that the, the light particles couple less than the heavy ones to the Higgs, okay? The essential decouplings are proportional to the mass of the Higgs, okay? So, but I, here I was just mentioning that uh, that this is not gauge invariant because this is in a doublet and this is in a singlet. So uh, I mentioned also that because of this peculiarity, you can never, you do not generate fermion masses if you think of a theory beyond the standard model that breaks into the standard model. In this breaking, you will not generate masses for the uh, standard uh, quarks. Which is very good. At least that problem is solved. You, know, you don't have the, the, say, the standard quarks acquiring a, a mass of grand unification, for example. But you don't understand the spectrum of the of the quarks, you know, because there is a large spectrum between the up quark to to the top quark. There is a, a, a huge uh, difference. You know, the ratio is very very small. So then I. Okay, I continue. I, I, I talked about uh, 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 details about, I mean, the masses are, are, as you see, you can you can see right away here that uh, 
the, the couplings, if you uh, solve for the couplings, it's the mass divided by V, okay? So it's uh, the V, uh, uh, if the masses are small, the, the couplings are going to be small, okay? In other words, the other way around, the couplings are chosen to be small, they are free in order to fit the spectrum that we know. Okay? It's a very primitive way of understanding masses, okay? And then, uh, and then I asked the question that, you know, Professor Junti already talked a lot about that, about the neutrino masses. In the SM, neutrinos are massless. The, there is no direct mass because new R is not introduced. Majorana mass, a left-handed one, you could not exist because you would require a triplet, and this is not invariant. And so you cannot write a bare mass like that. And more, something that the authors of the standard model were very proud, is that due to B minus L conservation, there will be no mass even in higher words, okay? So uh, I talk about the diagonalization of uh, uh, the, the quark mass matrix, and it's through that diagonalization, because you diagonalize different for the ups and the downs, they are different Yokawa couplings, you can see that there can be a mismatch that essentially is the so-called VCKM matrix, okay? I mentioned yeah, last time, and I repeat today, that this is essentially trivial in the gauge theories because there is universality, but at the time that Kabibu introduced his mixing, that was highly non-trivial. So again, I may emphasize that uh, there is no leptonic mixing, therefore the observation of neutrino oscillations it's, uh, it rules out the standard model. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you can change the standard model in a very simple way, which is making it actually simpler than the actual standard model, which is not put in the pocket right-handed neutrinos. If you don't put in the pocket right-handed neutrinos and obey to the rules, you have to write the, a mass term, Majorana mass term, to right-handed neutrinos, and immediately you have a seesaw mechanism. Neutrinos acquire a mass, and it is naturally small. So it's a very beautiful thing that uh, the great masters somehow, in the beginning, they didn't, uh, they, they, were, they had the prejudice against neutrino masses. It's clear. And they were very proud that their theory was exactly with uh, massless neutrinos, okay? So, the, I will come back to that question later on. It is, there is an implication of, also for CP violation. Uh, and, the, okay, this is electromagnetic current that becomes flavor diagonal, no problem. Uh, flavor change in neutral currents is just generalization of GIM you know, this becomes U. There is no mixing in the neutral current, which is crucial. And I I mentioned about how much pressure the, there was against the uh, neutral currents in general. And uh, I, I emphasize that, for example, the K0L will go to a certain rate, the normal rate of weak interactions. <laughs> but if this will be, exist, S and D are, are, are have the same charge, charge Q minus one third, uh, quarks, if they could uh, combine to Z, that would be a disaster because that would be in total disagreement with the experiment. That's why people had prejudice. People, I mean, both experimentalists and theoreticians against neutral currents until gauge theories appeared and they said, no, neutral currents have to exist and you should look at it. I must be uh, more precise. It is not true that you cannot build a model with, uh, without neutral currents. In the beginning, neutral currents didn't appear. So, uh, Glasher and George I built the George I Glasher model and based on SO, SO3, but they had to introduce a new particle, heavy lepton, where there, there were no uh, neutral currents, okay? But that was just be, be, before neutral currents were discovered, you know? Uh, so, then while they were discovered and, and uh, SU2 or SU1 became really the theory. I mentioned also against uh, this event that the parity was uh, somehow was predicted by the theory, parity violation in, in atomic physics. It was not seen in the beginning, but then later on it was seen and in agreement with the standard model. Although the, although the standard model does not have a flavor change in neutral currents, it has uh, at the one loop contributes to delta S equal to two transitions, and therefore K0, K0 bar transitions also BD, BD bus addition, and this is an important tool to test the standard model. There is a lot of work uh, studying, uh, I mean, there was a lot of work studying, now it's finished, I mean, people have done, already done most of the work. There are still some 
uncertainty when you translate this into real hadronic transition, because here I'm talking about quarks. You know that quarks, you, they are not see, uh, seen free. You, you really have to talk about, uh, in this case, kaons and the B, uh, B0 mesons and so on. You cannot avoid QCD. QCD, although we are talking about the weak uh, interactions, QCD is very important there also. So I, I give a, a, uh, another, another homework. This is a very important homework because it's one of the simplest ways of, uh, I will explain in more detail, but this was just homework to see, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to see uh, what happens if you add to the standard model just one. You could prefer to add three, but OK, the, the, the essential points can be seen if you, if you have just one. If you need just one Levector-like quark, what is a vector like quark is one that where the left-handed part transforms in the same way as the right-handed part, OK? If you add such a, a heavy particle, I mean, I say heavy uh, because this particle, contrary to the particles of the standard model, is not protected by, by S2 cross U1 uh, gauge invariance because the mass term is invariant under S2 cross U1. So it could be quite large, OK? Hopefully. Uh, hopefully, in the sense that I hope that will be discovered, it, 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 it should not be too heavy. The simplest model that is in agreement with all uh, experimental data with spontaneous CP violation, for example, it requires the existence of, of, of these things. The other simple model is the one of TDLE that I mentioned. That model has, has problems alone, but if you introduce the symmetry again, you can. Uh, I will not talk much about that because this is something that we are just finishing, you know, and uh, and I don't want to talk about it. It will be too confusing. But this is a, a, a very simple model that I will describe then later on in detail. Another thing that this model will have is flavor change in neutral currents at three level. It seems that I'm contradicting myself. I said that the, the, you cannot have flavor change in neutral currents at three level, but they are suppressed automatically. Similar to the seesaw. Seesaw, there is a suppression of neutrino masses with m squared divided by capital M, right? So here the suppression will be measure, uh, ratio of two masses. The standard model uh, uh, scale, which is V, divided by a large mass, which be of the order of TEV or even larger. So this suppression allows for the existence of flavor change in neutral currents, uh, but suppressed, OK? Anyway, so. Uh, okay, I, I talked about the importance of. Uh, uh, another important point is that since these transitions don't appear at three level in standard model, they appear on at one loop. The standard model uh, contributes at, at loop level, so new physics has the chance, even if it is suppressed, it, it, to, to to give significant contribution because it could contribute at three level, you know, and therefore compete with the uh, with uh, one loop level okay, of the standard model. Now, I emphasize that the CP violation is also a fundamental phenomenon because we know that in order to create barrier symmetry of the universe, you need at some level uh, barrier uh, uh, CP violation. And uh, there are many m m models of, of uh, to generate barrier symmetry of the universe. I will only talk about one particular one, which is leptogenesis. Uh, in then my next lecture. Uh, and of course, since CP violation is very much connected to, to flavor uh, and to other aspects of, of the standard model, the, the search for new physics, uh, in, especially in flavor, it will very often include CP violation, new sources of CP violation apart from the standard model. I mentioned that the origin of CP violation is not known yet in general, but in the standard model, uh, I mentioned that uh, within the standard model, CP violation arises as a clash between CP properties allowed by the gauge interactions and CP transformation properties required by Yukawa interaction. I will explain this in great detail, okay? Uh, and, and, and it's worthwhile, okay? Learning. So, uh, I, another point that I will emphasize is in the study of CP violation, one should allow for the most general CP transformation. Typically, LCP leaves a large freedom. You know, the part of the Lagrangian that conserves CP leaves a, a large freedom in the choice of definition of CP transformation. Okay? I did the study 
first in uh, in the mass eigen state i already did show that uh, if you allow for this transformation with arbitrary phases here then cp invariance obliges you the the vckm to have this characteristic this in itself it can always be trivially satisfied by choosing these phases but if you have uh, 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 you know if you, if you have a, a quartet is rephasing invariant, then that that quartet has should be real. In other words, there is a CP variation there if and only if any rephase invariant function of VCKM is not real. Okay, so you cannot talk about phases of VCKM, rather phases of that are rephasing invariant. Okay, rephasing of the quark field. I did parametric cut. I'm not going to repeat that. There is nothing special. The quartets that I mentioned the, the, that are rephasing invariant are things like this, you know. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the standard model with two generations, there is one quartet, you know, but by unitarity, uh, you can show that this quartet is real. It's right, it's a trivial, just multiply by, this is unitarity relation. If you multiply by US star VCS, you get here the, the US square VCS square, and here you get the argument of a QCD, yeah, but this is real, so the argument of this guy is just real. Okay. Then I talked about the, the, the triangle, the unitarity triangle. Uh, these are just the, the multiplication of two uh, lines, you know, or, I'm sorry, two columns. Of two columns, you get this, and this is the 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 so-called unitarity triangle. There are many unit, uh, triangles, but this one is very important because it's on this triangle that experimentalists and theoreticians work hard to see if there is an agreement between theory and experiment. I'll give you the, I will show you the, the, the plot that is uh, relevant. So this is the triangle. I may emphasize that uh, these angles here are arguments of invariant quartets. But by definition, alpha plus beta plus gamma, the very definition uh, gives uh, pi. So this is no, no proof of, uh, or no, no check, no test of unitarity. But today I will give you exact what, how could you test unitarity? Okay. The the geometric interpretation of the imaginary part of the quartet gives the area of the triangle. So the imaginary uh, since the imaginary part of all quartets are the same, means that all triangles have the same area. I mentioned here that there are many triangles of different types, but only these ones, you know, this one, this is one that I draw, I drew before, are with sides of the same size. So this is very interesting. And the internal angles of this triangle are the famous angles beta, gamma, and so on. Okay. Uh, by the way, it's strange how people get, to, the Japanese call it differently, you know, there, there was in the, in California, in Babar used to call alpha, beta, gamma, but they call phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, you know, and still maintain this notation different in the, in Japan and in the, in the, in the rest of the world, I think, in a way. Uh, so, so I mentioned also that you see sometimes people talk about strengths of CP violation. Since the imaginary part of quartet is equal for all quartets, this gives you the strength. Is it large or small? Well, you can choose any quartet. You know, this is a quartet that you can choose, this one. Why I'm choosing this one? Because you see, you see that this is lambda, this is lambda to the cube, this is lambda to the square. So, you know, this will be necessary very small, okay? Nothing to do with CP violation, it's just the mixing is small, okay? The mixing in the standard model. And since all triangles have the same area, you already, if you choose this one, you can see right away that you have to have a very small uh, uh, CP violation in the standard model. Now, parameterization, it's very similar to what Professor Junti did with the neutrinos. It's a nice way of, I will show you uh, more, very explicit why this parameterization is very good. This one way of parameterizing this thing, it has a built-in phase here, you know, so you get something like that. Why is this very good? There are many other ways of parameterizing. Why is this one very good? Because you can extract very easily the sides from experiment, the size of this S13. For example, if S13 is just the modulus of VUB, because this is VUB, you know, this term here. 
is VUS, VUB, VCB. So you get immediate S13 as VU, the modulus. Uh, well, anyway, S13 is, is, a, is an angle. Is, is actually by definition a positive angle, so it's modulus of VUB. S12 will be just uh, this one here. It's VUS divided by that. You know, you can measure uh, S12 and then S03. From experiment, you get very easily these three uh, angles, okay? So once SIJ are fixed, uh, it, 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 the, all the rest of the data has to be fit by a single parameter delta one three. Okay, this is easier to say than to actually do. V, the extraction of VUB it involves also hadronic physics, so it, there is ambiguity how to extract from experiment VUB. Okay, there is uncertainty from experiment. Oh, experiments always have some uncertainty, statistical uncertainty, but there is a lot of uncertainty from the theory. Okay, I mean there's a lot of people working because it involves QCD. You know. Uh, now, a very important point in the standard model, which is quite unfortunate in the, in the quark sector, is that the number of measurable quantities is much larger than the number of free parameters. See, once, this is what I say, once S12, S13, S23 is extracted in the way I just indicated, then you can make predictions for epsilon, the strength of CP violation in the chaos sector. Beta, I put beta bar here, is assuming that there may be new contributions for the mixing come from, from new physics. So this, what is measured is beta bar. And then gamma, the other angle. So all this is predicted just from one parameter, which is delta one three. It's fantastic, right? I mean, it's very, and it's in great contrast to what you're going to see. I will talk in detail in the leptonic set. In leptonic set, you have less number of measurables than uh, uh, parameters. You know, sort of quantities that, that can be in principle measured. Okay, so there is a lack of, of data, you know, in, in the leptonic set. I will be more precise next. So in the end, this is a famous unitary triangle with the, the way you see it in the in many many conferences. You can see right away. Let me describe how for people who are not working on this, uh, you see this one here, this circle here. You just you 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 put here an origin and then an origin and then you put VUB. You know, so it's a circle. The uncertainty. It's not just a circle, two, two ones, because there is a, some uncertainty, okay? And then you do the same one for this side here. With this side measures VTD. More precisely, VTD, VTB. But VTB is essentially equal to one, okay? Because the top quark couples to the bottom, essentially, from the data, because of unitarity, you know that this is essentially equal to one. So you are measuring VTD. But, uh, by measuring VTD, you get, uh, you know, but I'm sorry, by measuring BDBD by mixing, you get this quantity here. Now, why do they put here delta M, D and delta M, M, S? Because actually what is very important, I mean, you have less uncertainty in the ratio between delta M, D and delta M, S. Many of the ironic uncertainties cancel. So if you measure that, you get more restriction. In other words, here you have a, a, a region. That, but you see, then you, you measure beta. So it's, see, this is not a line. There's a is uncertainty, you know. So, the, so altogether, you put, you see here, a very small region where every everything fits together uh, within the standard model. That's nice for the standard model, but that's bad for those of us, and which most of us want to see new physics, want to want these precise experiments that are very difficult to make. This fantastic uh, Babar and and uh, Bell, and then now LACB, they are beautiful experiments with a lot of data. But there are some, there are some uh, anomalies. I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. Some things that are still we don't know exactly, either from experiment or from, from theory at all, we don't know. But from experiment is still not completely defined. But that, there is a lot of work there. But even apart from those anomalies, there is still a lot of room. For example, you may ask, well, I was drawing these box diagrams, and I said that new physics could contribute to them, right? New, what does that mean? That means that this side here, will not be the only contribution for, for which is VTD, uh, will not be the only contribution to, uh, to BD, BD by mixing. There could be like 10% contribution from, uh, from some other at the amplitude level. So if you put to the square, you know, you get 1%. You know? So this is perfectly possible. Uh, still, even with present data, to have new contributions from new physics to BD, BD by mixing. If you want to know 
ask which new physics. It was very fashionable, almost, almost obligatory. Only decent new physics had to be supersymmetric, as you know. But now we have not discovered supersymmetry, so we have to be more cautious. I have no prejudice, you see. For me, prejudice, my only prejudice is let us look at nature and let us see what nature has to tell us and let us be modest and try to find a model that, that explains, okay? Of course, there are some theories that are more beautiful than the other ones, but that beauty is not a criteria, a only criteria, you know. Therefore, but anyway, I talked about supersymmetry, but that's one example where there are new contributions to BDBD by mixing and uh, to BSPS by mixing, okay? Now, partial conclusion, there is experimental evidence that VCKM is complex, even if one assumes new physics beyond the standard model. Now, why is that the case? This is something I want to emphasize, very important. It's this gamma. I, I mentioned about new, contribution, new physics contributions, for example, to this side. But for gamma, I will not go into the details here, but you can trust me that there is essentially no model that predicts new physics contributions to gamma. So if you measure gamma, and now gamma is not zero, it's different from zero, it's actually relatively large, then you know that uh, even if you assume new physics, that uh, VCKM is complex, okay? Uh, so those of you who are a little bit not so young, uh, you heard about the theory of super weak theory. The first theory of CP violation was uh, proposed by, by Lincoln Wolfenstein in the very beginning. And that theory was not eliminated, you know, even in modern times, until before gamma was measured. Because you say, well, what about epsilon? How would you, you explain epsilon? Well, even if VCKM would be real, epsilon could be explained you know, from a new delta S equal to two transition, like, and so on. So, but now there is no way of avoiding VCKM complex. Uh, but the complex VCKM may not originate from, that is, it's not, a, to say that VCKM is complex doesn't mean that it comes from equal couplings. You see, this is what I want to emphasize. Why? Uh, okay. Uh, let, let me go back to the model of TD Lee, okay? So you have two vacuum potential values. No. Only, only one phase. Okay, but this one cannot be removed. And the mass of the down course will be like Yukawa coupling of the first Higgs multiplied by vacuum potential value plus of the second Higgs multiplied by this with a phase. Now, these are arbitrary. You know, they are real but arbitrary. Flavor structure is arbitrary. So you can essentially make any MD you want with just one phase, but playing with the, with the real couplings, okay? So if you talk, the most important quantity is MD, MD dagger, because that is what leads to this UDL matrix. And therefore, in general, this model, there is nothing wrong uh, and uh, leads to complex VCKM. You may ask, why do people are not talking much more about this T.D. Lee model? T.D. Lee is a great, great man, and he says the model. Why we don't, for many years, we don't talk, didn't talk about it? Because of flavor change in neutral currents. These ones here, this model, as he suggested, Medi they, they, there is uh, Higgs scalar, uh, scalar mediated flavor change in neutral currents. Although they are suppressed because these scalar currents are proportional to the quark masses, but still it's too large to, uh, to be in agreement with the experiment in general. But you can uh, introduce exosymmetries. This is something that we are finishing now. It's a tri non trivial in at all, you know. Uh, to have symmetries that have a suppression mechanism, special one that does not kill CP violation, that, uh, for example, the standard, the SUSY has two X doublets, right? We know also, but if you calculate the minimum of, of SUSY, you get actually a phase of pi over two, you think it's a maximal CP violation, not at all, it's zero, you know. You can prove formally that in SUSY, minimal SUSY, you cannot have spontaneous CP violation. You can have by a, a, a additions, okay? But you cannot have that. But, uh, uh, you know, it's crucial that this phase here will generate a complex VCG. So in order to be realistic, models of spontaneous CP violation should be a natural, should have a natural mechanism to suppress scalar or vector flavor change in neutral current. As I promised, I'm going to give you a specific model with spontaneous CP violation in agreement with the experiment, uh, but where uh, heavy quarks, you know, vector-like heavy quarks are introduced. Now, now I'm going to make a completely different uh, uh, way of attacking, in my, my opinion, the most beautiful one. Unfortunately, we wrote it, you know, remember, 1986. 
If we had done this in 1973, we would have a nice phone call from Stockholm, but it was too late, you know. And you can see, you may say, well, it's easy because you knew already. No, no, you could do that. Any good graduate student, I was a graduate student in 1973, uh, good could, that could believe what the essential ingredients is to understand the statement that the T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang a long time ago that the CP is defined by the part of Lagrangian that conserves CP, and you should always choose the most general CP tessellation. Only obeying that and knowing how to do Dirac ecology, you can derive the result. You will see how I will never talk about eliminating phases, nothing. Just pure algebra, very simple one also. Okay? So let, let us go then slowly, because this is original. Not many people know it, and, and it's not, anyway, very common to, to study this way. Uh, so uh, LSP is the part of Lagrangian that conserves CP, typically gauge interactions, okay? In order to analyze whether the whole Lagrangian violates CP, one has to check whether the CP transformations under LCP uh, implies non-trivial restrictions in the rest of the Lagrangian. This can be applied to the standard model, but can be applied to any theory you want. Can be applied to supersymmetry, anything you want. The same principle, okay? So. Uh, so, what is the difference? When you write the CP transformation, for example, to the up quark, there is no, in the gauge interactions, don't distinguish the up quark from the charm quark to the top quark. So, under CP, you should allow the most general transformation, which in principle will involve the unitary matrix that will mix up these quarks, okay? Because they are exactly the same, you know? Gauge interactions do not distinguish that. The same thing for the downs, you know, yeah, I will do the same. But here, you have to have the same KL here and here because uh, charged currents, you know, charged currents oblige that they transform in the same way because they are together in the charged currents. They have to transform in the same way. They can mix up, but this is a unitary matrix, three by three unitary matrix. These ones can be different because there are no uh, right-handed charged currents, you know. This can be different. So KL, KU, and KD are unitary matrix acting flavor space. Uh, yes, yes, uh, it was not really necessary. I mean, you, you can put that one, yes. It's it's really not so, uh, well, it's because of the W. You know, the W in, in the, the, it has to cancel, but in such a way that uh, in, in, the, in the couplings of the charge current, the W, I'm assuming that the W also transforms under CP. So it's just one phase, you know, there's no problem. But it will be totally, uh, how could I put it? Uh, harmless, you know, that phase. Okay. Uh, I'm just being picky and writing that, okay? Now, the, then, if you do, this is the ecology that the graduate students would have to do, you know, it can be shown that in order for Liukawa, you write the Liukawa couplings, you, know, you, you can be equivalent to MUMMD. I'm doing with MUMD, but you don't need to. You can do with Yukawa couplings, okay? And never need to talk about VCKM. You, you, you talk about, uh, but let's do it already, uh, after uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, you generate mass quarks. Again. So then, if you put the mass terms, you see that the, this, uh, there should exist a uh, unitary matrix that does this, that transforms this into its complex. This looks very, not very useful, right? Uh, anyway, you can do that just by doing, as I said, dear ecology, you know, that. Now, the existence of the matrix KL, KU, KR are necessary in sufficient conditions for CP invariant in the, uh, CP invariance in the SM. Again, this is not very useful, but let me let us be clever and try to massage these equations. So you have this, you know, I'm repeating the equation. If I multiply this equation by itself, you get mu mu dagger. You see, I got rid of this KUR, which will not play any role at all in the standard model, you know. So you have this and then mu mu dagger star here. Since it is a emission matrix, instead of the, the, the complex of, it's just HPT, it's more useful to talk about the transpose rather than this. So you get that KL, uh, CP invariance obliges that they should make a matrix KL that does this, that if you calculate the commutator, or not, not, there is nothing magic about the commutator, it's just useful. You can, I can do without using commutator, okay? And in other theories, like in my uranium retrainers, I will not use the commutator at all. But it's here, if I put the commutator, it's very easy, you get the commutator here of the T's, and of course, 
uh, you can put a minus outside because the transpose of, of a product of the commutator is, gets a minus sign, you know, and that gets a minus sign. So I can multiply this equation by itself an odd number of times to preserve this minus. So I get this relationship here. And if I calculate the trace, I get the CP invariance is obliging me that the trace of HUHC to R is equal to any odd number is equal to zero. CP invariance is obliging that. If I put R equal to 1, it's trivial because it's trace of a commutator obviously is zero. Uh, R equal to 3, already I get immediately a non-trivial constraint. Constraint on what? On a message or in due call couplings. Instead of HU, as I mentioned, I could have put here YU, YU dagger, YD, YD dagger. Therefore, I can examine the properties of the standard model before symmetry break, okay? So that's why I say in the, in the standard model, the CPE is violated by, by in the Lagrangian, you know, at the Lagrangian level. So let us see again, let us now be more ambitious and see more in, in make contact with the regular quantities, okay? R equal to one trivial satisfier, equal to three, you get that. And if you calculate this, in the in the standard model, you may say, but I have not talked about generations. I've never talked about generations here, right? Never mentioned. This is true for any number of generations. But for two generations, I, I turns out, it turns out that trace of the commutator to, to the cube for two by two matrices will be automatically uh, zero. Okay? I'm sorry, uh, real. Okay? So th therefore, actually zero because this is imagine. I'm sorry, it is automatically zero. Now. I'm sorry, the, the, the exercise is to prove this. How you know this is a, a, a fundamental quantity. Quark mass differences and the imaginary part of, the, of this quartet. So it gives you immediate, just by doing simple uh, transformation, and believing in the idea that CP transformation should be general, most general allowed by, by the part of Lagrangian that conserves CP, you get this result, you know, which is very nice, I think. You can use the same method to any theory that you want, you know, any complicated, including supersymmetry. We have done that also for supersymmetry. The problem with supersymmetry is that there are many, many, many invariants, you know. You may say, well, you said that this is uh, non-trivial for three or more generations. What happens for more generations? For more generations, you get not only one invariant, but many invariants. Here, it's necessary and sufficient for CP uh, invariance. In other words, if it, this is different from zero, for sure you you get uh, CP violation. If you, it is equal to zero, for sure that you get CP invariance. Okay. So it's necessary and sufficient to have uh, CP invariance to have this uh, equal to zero. If it's different from zero, you violate CP, and this is uh, a nice result. So now coming back to neutrinos. Okay. Let us now come back to neutrinos. In the standard model, neutrinos are strictly massless. I'm sorry. Um, sometimes I, I repeat myself, I'm sorry. Eh? Uh, so this I already explained. This is the term that violates B minus L by two units that is invariant. I, I'm sorry. This you cannot have. Yes, this you cannot have in the standard model. But um, I already mentioned this about the standard. Uh, SU5, again, you had B minus L, therefore no neutrino masses. Uh, and I already mentioned that the neutrinos, uh, the appearance of uh, neutrino oscillations and the further neutrino mass is physics beyond the standard model. And I mentioned again, repeating that this a strange feature of standard model that new R are not introduced. If you introduce new R, then it happens what I said. You get the mass that as Professor Junti explained, this mass would need to be, ex this Yukawa coupling, extremely small to fit the value of the neutrino masses. But uh, if you do the most natural thing and the simplest thing, which is maintaining new R, then you can get, you can write this. You are obliged to write this in a certain way because you always should write in the most general Lagrangian that is consistent with normalizability. So this term should be there. And this term can be much larger than V because it does not need uh, SC2 cross C1 breaking. And then you get immediately the famous seesaw. Remember, I, I'm getting seesaw just with a very simple extension of standard model. This was not the way that seesaw was invented. The seesaw was invented 
in the context of SO10 where where you had to, you know, Galman, Slansky, and Ramon, Galman, and Slansky, they had to do something to save their theory, and they invented seesaw. You know, at least I uh, was told by Ramon that that's why they invented seesaw. Uh, but already in this minimal extension standard model, sometimes it's called new SM or SM new. Uh, uh, it's actually simpler than the standard model to have this new R. And the OU obtains as almost only in a very natural way. What is the defect of seesaw? You don't know what this scale is, you see. This is the effect of many theories, like like Susie. You know, Susie is beautiful, no question. But where is the Susie breaking? You know? We, we don't know. If the experiment puts more limits, then we put the masses larger. That is a very contrary to standard model. Standard model didn't have a choice, you know. Charm, for example, was invented by the standard model, could not be very heavy. Otherwise, the theory will be in disagreement to the experiment immediately. And uh, Z, again, the mass was predicted. Everything was predicted, you know. So it was luck. I mean, apart from being a very ingenious and economical model, there was a lot of luck, you know, in the standard model. Here, it see, so solves this problem, but does not tell you what is MR. There is a great controversy, as you can imagine. Now there is LHC. There are some theoreticians saying that, okay, MR need not be super heavy. You could have even uh, right-handed neutrinos to be discovered at LAC. Okay, these three are a little bit not very, very clear cut, but they are not wrong. You know, they are just more complicated. The simplest seesaw would require a rather large right-handed neutrino. So now, uh, let me now. Uh, I want to talk about now. Yes. Well, I, I'm not a specialist on that, but anyway, I, the, the usual answer is to this question is, okay, if Susie is broken at a very high scale, then he's not going to explain the gauge hierarchy, why, why, why the Higgs is so light, you know, it's, that is uh, the thing that, uh, that was one of the reasons for us to believe in, in Susie, because it was necessary, not only to believe in Susie, but to eliminate or to fight anyone who would not do supersymmetric extension of standard model, okay? That is, has changed now. Now many people who used to do supersymmetric extension, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? The ones that, that, uh, ah, yes. Not, I'm not, I'm not prejudiced, either in favor of Susie or against Susie, you know? I think we should listen to experiment and help our experimentalist be very open to see what the theoreticians are predicting, and also what theoreticians are not predicting, you know, just solid experimental physics. This is very important, okay? Yes. No, no. You could introduce symmetries where these things uh, are understood, yes, about more or less. But not, if you ask me, is there a model that is a standard model of flavor? There is no standard model of flavor, you know, to understand. There are many models, you know, but there is no standard model of flavor. So now I'm going to study carefully the the same things that I did with quark sector in the in the in the lepton sector. Okay, so I'm forgetting about the, the details of seesaw. I'm just saying, okay, somehow this mass matrix, this effective mass matrix at low energy, is generated. You know, this is a left-handed mass that was generated through this mechanism, and I'm forgetting about right-handed neutrinos, assuming that they are very heavy and they don't enter into anything. Okay, so. Uh, this is all standard, just the neutrino has a mass and it's a Majorana mass. Now, if you do that, then I can always go, it's convenient to do the way I'm going to do, is go to the, to the weak basis where ML, which is uh, arbitrary complex matrix, you can always choose to a, to a basis where ML is going to be diagonal. And M nu is a Majorana mass with so symmetric complex matrix, there is great redundancy in ML and MU. Uh, and that redundancy is like in the quark sector, is arises from the, the freedom to make weak basis transformation. Okay? This is a transformation where neutrinos transform with a unitary matrix and then the, the charge left in the same way because it's a weak basis transformation. And under this transformation, ML and MU will change. This one will change this way, this one will change that way. Okay, this is just how the, the, the leptonic masses transform under weak basis transformation. 
and I can choose. See this now, be, be careful. I can choose a basis without loss of generality where ML is diagonal, diagonal and real. Okay. So all the mixing, see, all the mixing will be uh, considered by, by, by will be generated by neutrino mass maybe. Okay. There is nothing wrong in doing that. It's completely general. I could do the other way around, but it's better. It's more interesting to do with, with, in this way. Okay. You see immediately the difference between quarks and Majorana neutrinos by doing this way, okay? So, uh, the L remains invariant, but, uh, you know, if, if I now do, you see, I, let me repeat, I go to the base where ML is diagonal. In this base, we can still make a rephasing, which is to transform both the charged leptons and the neutrinos by the same matrix, okay? The charged leptons, uh, the, the, under this rephasing, the L will remain invariant. You know, this is just a, a, a phase transformation in the charged lepton. They are diagonal, so they remain continue diagonal real. But M nu will transform in this way. So the phases that P in M nu, as I may, you mentioned, M nu is a complex 3 by 3 matrix, OK? These phases change in, the, in this simple way, OK? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So, so you can count the, the number of physical phases in M nu. So initially you have a, a one half n n minus one. So you get six, you know, six uh, phases. But three of them can be eliminated in this way. So you get all the way one half of of, of six. Is, so it's three. For n equal to three, the mass matrix of Majorana neutrinos, you know. I'm not talking about mixing yet, not PM and S, just ma the matrix. It has three phases. And uh, M nu will have, you know, uh, six parameters, three on the diagonal and three off the diagonal. They are symmetric, so it's only six. Okay, so all together, you have nine uh, quantities, you know, in the neutrino mass matrix. Which means that if you want to, disc to derive from experiment the structure of neutrino masses, uh, you should fix nine quantities, OK? Now, there is a tragedy here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know this is just a side remark. I didn't go to the tragedy yet. Uh, except for rephasing variant monomials, you know, the individual mass made elements of the neutrino mass don't have meaning, but you can, gen you can construct polynomials that are invariant under this rephasing, OK? And again, uh, later on, if I diagonalize then the, the, the neutrino mass matrix, I will generate very similar to what happens in the in the in the quark sector. You get this PMNS matrix. Okay, uh, you don't have much freedom here. You cannot redefine the phase of Majorana neutrinos because in Majorana, if you do rephasing, then the phase appears in the mass matrix. Okay, because this is Majorana new transposed new. So you cannot, but you can do in the charge in the in the in charge lepton sector. Okay, you can do that. Uh, so if you do that, then so you cannot eliminate as many phases. You can generate the PMNS matrix that Professor Junot already talked a lot about. It. This is charge leptons. Here the notation is U electron one elect one twist for the neutrinos. You know, the, the the ones that have definite mass. Uh, you get you get something like that, and oh, I'm sorry. What is this? Uh, yes. So you have. A, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, uh, yes. I'm sorry. I I'm confusing. Going. Yes, I'm going here. Yes. And then yes. I'm no, for the moment we do not introduce constraints of three. Uh, OK, for the moment, we do not introduce constraints of 3 by 3 unitarity. But note that in the context of type 1 seesaw, the PMNS matrix, strictly speaking, is not unitary. Deviations of unitarity will be very small due to the large mass of MR. Okay. You can talk again about the, you, you, remind, uh, you recall that I talk about these uh, angles. You can define. Uh, even if you forget about unitarity, you can define nine moduli, if, for example, in VCKM, and four rephasing invariant phases also in, uh, 
in, uh, in VCKM, which are independent from each other, if, even if you don't have unitarity. Beta, gamma, chi, and chi prime. Why only four? Because you have nine elements, but you get five phases can be uh, eliminated, so you get four independent uh, phases, okay? Now, the novel feature, completely different feature, I, I, you know, of, uh, of neutrinos, Majorana neutrinos, a novel feature, is that uh, not only quartets are rephasing invariant, but you can have bilinears that are rephasing invariant. You see, this is L and L, so you L, you L star. So you can change the phase of, of, the, of the charged leptons, but you cannot rephase alpha and beta, which refer to neutrinos. And therefore, this is rephasing invariant because you cannot rephase neutrinos. So bilinears are. So the most rigorous way of defining Majorana phases is arguments of bilinears, you know. Not because people talk always the phases that are outside the PMNS. That is five minutes. Oh, my God. Uh, that is a very uh, not. Um, I mean, it's it, it is a, a, a parameterization dependent. I don't want to do things that are parameterization dependent. If I need, of course, I have to. But but as far as possible, one should avoid explicit. So you can re re redefine. You can define six independent Majorana type phases, you know, and you can prove it's a very amusing thing that out of these phases. Assuming unitarity, you can rebuild the full PMNS matrix. How? First, you rebuild, uh, you build the, 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 these arguments, you know, the, the Dirac type invariants, and then with the rest remain, you can prove that you can construct the full. This is a little bit theor theoretical because you cannot actually measure all these Majorana type phases. Okay? Now. Let me continue. A surprise. Uh, yes, I already mentioned that. I'm sorry. So now, I a convenient way of parameterizing the VCKM, the PMNS, is using the standard parameterization. Okay, but I can even do more. I can eliminate this phase here by doing this transformation, and this particular way of parameterizing will be very useful in the in the analysis of double beta decay. Okay. Now the now I can repeat these unitarity triangles but with very important difference. There are Dirac unitarity triangles, these ones when you rephase the charge leptons they rotate. And there are Majorana unitary triangles where the orientation of the triangle is meaningful. And you cannot do it because you cannot redefine the angles of uh, the phases of, uh, of uh, the neutrinos, okay? So this is an example of a Majorana triangle, U, E1, U, E3, this you can do that. So the argument of uh, this quantity is equal to pi, you know, minus gamma 3, gamma 1. So the Majorana phase, they give the directions of the sides of Majorana unitarity triangle. Errors have no meaning. They can be removed, reversed by making this transformation u3 going to minus u3. That is allowed by because there is no the new t new is invariant under minus sign, you know, with in the, in the so the limit of CP invariance. I, I would just finish. The limit of CP invariance in with Majorana neutrinos is that the neutrinos has to collapse. Once they collapse, the Dirac type of CP violation disappears. But the orientation, you know, to have no CP violation, the orientation, the collapse should be along either the real axis or the imaginary axis, okay? Now, let me emphasize, I think that was already emphasized by Professor Junti, is that the ones that are going to be measured in the future, you know, the, the people are trying to measure, is for in neutrino oscillations, is direct type CP violation. Only this one appears in neutrino oscillations, okay? Not Majorana. Majorana type is, I will finish with this one, Neutrino, only in neutrinoless double beta decay, you get uh, these are these phases that I defined, you know, Majorana phases. Okay? So oh, it appears the, the strength of double beta decay will depend on this phase. It's the only quantity that are sensitive to the Majorana. Uh, okay. So maybe I will stop here and then continue next time.
Are there are questions? In this uh, Majorana rephasing invariance, how yes. do they enter in measurable quantities? For example, in the neutrinos double beta decay, you can express uh, this effective mass uh, in terms of the uh, Majorana rephasing invariance? Uh, yes, I mean, in, in, I mean, in, in, you can express in terms of, of this quantity here, you know, in terms of, um, I'm sorry. Is with angles. Yeah. You you can express in these these by uh, by linears, you know. But you're talking about something else. Probably you're talking about an invariant that could see my urana phase. Is that what you're saying? Because that I will construct next time. An invariant similar to what this trace of the commutator to the cube, you can do that also for my urana phases. Okay? Things that are sensitive. Invariance that you introduced in the Majorana case. So you introduced some bilinear invariance in the Majorana case. Yes, yes. And this, uh, how they, they, they enter, enter in into? Yes, in beta decay they enter here. You see, these are the, all these are uh, uh, the phases arguments of bilinears. I'm not using any specific parameterization. You see, you mm. want only moduli and the Majorana uh, type phases, which are the phases of of of, of, of uh, bilinears. Mm -hmm. Of course, I can also explain this, write this, this in terms of, in this explicit parameterization, in terms of the phases that appear as Majorana phases. But I don't like that so much because it depends on the parameterization. You, 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 you don't know the value of, of the, if you ask, what is the size of Majorana phases? There is no answer to that, depends on, as usual, you know, as usually defined. There is no, no answer because there is, depends on parameterization. Here it does not depend, you know. Here I'm defining rephasing invariant quantity, so therefore, yes, are, are arguments of bilinears, uh, not in turn angles of the orientation of the triangle. Yes, 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 because these are my phases. Yes. Yes. So uh, I may have missed something quite uh, basic, but is there any CP violation possible? in this uh, lepton sector? Oh, yes, yes. It, it, how, uh, there are two types. The, 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 no, I mean, in, in, in neutrino oscillations, you can see that. In neutrino oscillation, yes. One of the problems that I will talk again in the next lecture is that we don't have much. You remember that I told you that in the neutrino mass matrix, in the basis where the charged leptons are diagonal, have nine quantities that you need to measure. But if you count the number of quantity that you can measure in the electronic sector, it's very, you know, you have uh, in the neutrinos, you will have the difference of masses, which is two difference of masses, two, and then you have the, uh, you know, the three angles that, that parameterize PM and S, so it's another three degree five, and then Dirac phase that you can measure in the neutrino oscillations, and double beta decay. All, if you get all this, that is seven. Even if you assume that the, the absolute value of the neutrinos can be measured, which Lasho was not assuming that it was not possible, but even if you assume it's eight, eight compared to nine. So you see here, contrary to the quark sector, where you have an overdetermination of uh, the quark mass matrix, here is underdetermination. You know, this is what I will mention again next time also. Okay. It's much more difficult. The good thing in the electronic sector is no hadronic uncertainty. You don't need, QCDs does not enter there. Otherwise, but very little data, you know, unfortunately. Okay. It's very hard, but it's very exciting also, because since there is no uncertainty, you have very clean physics in a certain sense. Oh, yes, something like that, yes, yes. Something like that, equivalent, yes. It's difficult to talk about that. Maybe, maybe. So okay. before moving to the next speaker, let me remind you that tomorrow at 5, there will be a celebration here, a ceremony celebrating the 40th anniversary of the school with the speech and the concert and the cocktail. So uh, don't forget this. Thank you.
The next speaker of today is Cedric, which is who is going to continue. So, Ça c'est une bannière. So, second lecture of Massive Gravity. Yes. So, um, maybe before I start, is there any question about yesterday? So today, um, can you hear me well? Yes. So today I'm going to discuss uh, the um, uh, first Pauli theory. Um, so uh, which was introduced by uh, Fierce and, and Pauli, obviously, in, uh, in 1939, at least for a flat space time at, at the background. So, uh, so this theory is a, is a unique, um, consistent theory of, of a massive graviton, uh, so H mu nu, uh, propagating on on a, on a given background, um, on a, a background uh, G mu nu, and. Um, uh, and it, it's a linear theory, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a linear theory in the sense that the equation of motion uh, are linear. Um, the equation of motion for H mu nu. And it is the only consistent one in the sense that any deviation from this theory would yield uh, propagation of uh, more degrees of freedom than, than the five uh, required for a massive graviton on, uh, at least on a flat space time for when G mu nu is flat. And um, uh, in, um, in some, I mean, general cases, or when you, when you modify at least a mass term, as I will explain, not only you get more degrees of freedom, but you also get uh, negative energies. So you really should stick to this theory if you want to have a consistent theory. And I'm going to discuss it uh, here in a framework that is slightly more general than the one used by Fierce and Pauli historically. Uh, because I'm going to discuss uh, the C theory when G mu nu is uh, parameterizing uh, not only uh, flat space time, but uh, generic uh, Einstein space time. So I will assume that G mu nu obey uh, the equation of Einstein in vacuum. Okay. So this uh, extension have been uh, have been um, discovered, or exp I mean, after Fierce and Pauli by various people which I'm going to give reference of uh, later. Okay, so, um, so this theory can be defined by, by its field equation to begin with. So the field equation of Fierce Pauli uh, read as follows. So you, you take the uh, kinetic tensor that I introduced yesterday, um, that I introduced in equation 114, I think. And you, uh, you add a mass term. So the, the field equation read as written here. Uh, so you have a mass term. Uh, of this type. Uh, and then you can couple this graviton H mu nu to uh, an energy momentum tensor. So uh, the first Pauli theory, first Pauli, correspond to a specific choice of this parameter alpha and beta. So these are uh, parameters, right, here. 
so it corresponds to the choice of alpha equal beta, and I can choose this to be equal to one because if it's not, I can just renormalize the mass, right? So it's what really defines first Pauli is the equality between alpha and beta. Okay, but I'm going to discuss uh, here this theory in a slightly more general situation than first Pauli. So I will I will leave for a, a certain equation. I will leave the possibility that alpha differ from beta. Right. Okay. So um, so this is my equation. Now uh, two one one. Um, and I will also define uh, a field a field equation operator, which for future reference, which is just x mu nu plus uh, one half m square uh, alpha h mu nu minus beta h g mu nu. So this is just the field equation operator uh, in the vacuum of this theory. Uh, so let me if, call this equation two one uh, two uh, two one four. I think it's two one four. So there will be other equation later on. Okay, so this um, theory has, a, has an action, and uh, so this part is just uh, you know coming from the uh, Einstein-Liebert action that you expand at quadratic order around uh, this background. So this uh, this x mu nu and this mass term, it, it comes it has a, an easy action, which is just uh, this one. So if you just add to the quadratically expanded einstein hilbert action, this term, uh, alpha uh, h mu nu square minus beta trace of h square, you uh, get the correct, uh, the correct equations. Right? Okay, so this is uh, also an equation I would like to remember for the following. This is my equation two. Uh, one, uh, two. And uh, also for the sake of the future, I would like to write down the full action now, the full action of this theory uh, is uh, written as follows. So uh, you have the uh, okay, and then there is this guy here. So this, this piece is, uh, is just the einstein hilbert uh, piece again. Then you have, you have the, also the cosmological constant piece, right? And then you have this uh, mass term here. Uh, okay, then you add this uh, SM here, and then you can also. Um, sorry. Uh, you're right, yes, it should be. There is a mistake here, one half. Thank you. So there is a mass term, and then there is a coupling. Uh, we can couple it to, to, to energy momentum tensor of, of matter. Okay. So. Um, okay, so um, uh, the operator um, uh, X here obeys uh, some interesting uh, identity because of Bianchi identity that uh, I recalled uh, yesterday, right? Uh, it turns out that X uh, is, is conserved. So you have the property that the Bianchi identity, uh, the, the nonlinear Bianchi identity, right? implies that uh, d mu of x mu nu is zero. <coughs> uh, okay, and this will play a role in the following. And also, you, you notice, obviously, that this mass term uh, breaks uh, fully the, the, gauge, uh, the gauge symmetry, right? So this breaks uh, the gauge uh, symmetry the linear gauge symmetry that was recalled uh, yesterday. Um, 
uh, in equation 114, that is uh, so the, the one when h mu goes to h mu nu plus uh, d mu uh, xi nu uh, symmetrized. Okay, so a last, uh, a last note is, is that, um, so in this equation there is a, uh, an, assumption, an assumption which is, is a, coupling, a coupling to uh, an energy momentum uh, tensor. So uh, uh, usually what people do is that they assume that this is uh, conserved. So, and so one assume in general Uh, that uh, d mu of t mu is zero. So this is, again, the covariant derivative with respect to the background, right? So you can question this uh, assumption, of course, because you don't have gauge invariance. Yes? Right. In the, yeah, in a sense, yes, here. But you, you will see later that you can sort of restore this uh, in geometrical interpretation. Because here, you see, I'm, I'm discussing just a linear theory. So there is no, um, you know, there, you can see, you can consider this theory as just a theory with two tensors, h mu nu and g mu nu, living on some uh, space time, right? So you, it's a bimetric or bi tensor theory, if you want, with a linear equation for uh, one of the tensors, and so far, no equation for the other tensor. Um, What do you mean by geometrical quantities? Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So one assume, yes, one assumes the conservation of this uh, energy momentum tensor. But so uh, you can, in fact, try to relax this hypothesis. And uh, some, some aspect of this is discussed in a very uh, influential paper that I will also mention later uh, by Boulware and Desert in 1972 um, when, when they discussed some con consequences of relaxation of this hypothesis of conservation. But no, to my knowledge, no, nothing really interesting uh, came out of this, uh, of such uh, assumption. So I, I will assume also that it's conserved. Okay, so now I would like to uh, uh, count degrees of freedom. Uh, in this theory uh, in uh, different ways. So first, uh, let me uh, do it in a, in a covariant way. Okay. Um, so it can be done as follows. Uh, so you, you start from the, the field equation here. And you noticed uh, that because uh, you have this Bianchi identity here, and because also uh, the energy momentum tensor is conserved, that if you act with a covariant derivative on this uh, equation, right, uh, you, uh, you get an interesting identity, well, an interesting equation. Uh, you get that uh, d mu <coughs> uh, of h mu nu multiplied by alpha is equal to beta times d nu of h, right? Uh, so that's uh, just a consequence, again, of Bianchi identity and conservation of energy momentum tensor. So, and that's four equations, right, uh, which are first order. So four first order uh, equations, which are usually called the vector constraints because they are first order. Hence, uh, you, from the Lagrangian point of view, uh, you can consider they are constraints and not uh, field equation, right? Or not second order equation, at least not equation of propagation, right? So um, in this, um, in this uh, spirit, you can uh, conclude from that that you started from 10 uh, degrees of freedom in H mu nu, which is a symmetric tensor, so it has 10 independent components. When you sub then you subtract four vector constraints, and so you should have six uh, degrees of freedom. So this is, of course, uh, a little bit, um, you know, cavalier because it's, you should do uh, what you should do is really a Miltonian analysis, but it it it, it works in the sense that it gives the correct result. 
Uh, so far, six, you have six degrees of freedom. Um, but then we should uh, find a way to remove another one if we want to find that uh, a graviton, massive graviton, has five degrees of freedom as it should, right? Um, so how it works is as follows. First, you can, uh, so let me call, yeah, let me call this, um, this vector constraint, let me give a name to these. Uh, let me call this two. 2, 1, 1, right? And so if you act another time with a deri covariant derivative on this equation, right? 2, 2, 1, 1 acted upon with a covariant derivative gives the following equation, uh, d, mu, d mu h mu nu is equal to beta uh, d'Alembertian of h, uh, right? And so that's uh, first, that's now a second order equation. But then what you can do is that you can uh, also, uh, so these equations, I think, were 2, 1, 1, right? So you can also uh, now trace this equation, right? You can trace this equation here. So you, if you trace uh, 2, 1, 1, um, so you have to, re to do that, you, you have to do this calculation. I mean, I, maybe I'm not going to do it in detail on, on the blackboard, but you bas basically what you do is just you, you, you contract the menu uh, with, um, uh, well, with x menu plus uh, one half of m square, you know, alpha h menu minus beta h g menu. And so this uh, is equal to g mu nu, m Planck minus 2, t mu nu, right? And uh, then you compute the, the form of this trace, right? And so you find something uh, interesting. You find that uh, this equation reads, um, uh, so you can derive it as an exercise, a box of h minus uh, d rho d sigma h rho sigma plus lambda h. Um, okay, plus one half of m square uh, h alpha minus four beta is equal to uh, m Planck minus two t, where t is a trace of the uh, energy momentum tensor. So uh, what is interesting is that you see here this operator, uh, the second order uh, part of this equation, uh, is, um, is similar to this equation here, right? Except that there is different relative coefficients, at least if beta is not equal to alpha, between the box and this guy, right? So now using, uh, now using the, these two equations, right? Using this and this together, you get the very interesting equation that, uh, that is alpha minus beta over alpha times box H plus lambda plus one half of uh, m square alpha minus four beta h is equal to m Planck minus two t. <coughs> okay, so that's my equation two, two, one, three. And so, Lambda, yes, there is a par missing parenthesis, sorry. I'm suffering from jet lag, so you have to be careful with me. Okay, so um, so you see what's happening here is interesting. So if um, um, one can discuss various cases to interpret this equation. So if alpha, uh, if alpha equal beta, so in the, we are in the uh, first Pauli case. Uh, this first term disappears, right? And you are just left with an algebraic constraint on the trace. So in vacuum, if we were in vacuum, uh, we find that uh, so uh, uh, two lambda. So if I just look at the you know at t equals zero here, and I just uh, consider that alpha equal beta equal one. I get that two lambda minus three m square times h is uh, zero. 
Okay. Um, so now uh, he tells me that uh, for um, for generic cases, so meaning that when this does not vanish, uh, I get that H is zero in vacuum, right? So that the gravity and this is an extra constraint. This is an extra uh, constraint on the on the theory, right? On the graviton. So uh, H is stressless. Uh, so that's one constraint. And so now we went from uh, six, we go from six to five using this constraint, right? As, as it should. Okay, so this is, uh, this constraint is, is uh, also called sometimes a scalar constraint because it's scalar, obviously. Okay. Um, and uh, this corresponds to the generic case of, of a massive graviton propagating in such an Einstein spacetime. So these six, these five degrees of freedom, they can be decomposed uh, in a two uh, tensor uh, mode, two vector, two I mean polarization of vector, and one uh, one scalar. So I guess uh, analogous in, in using an analogous decomposition as the one presented by Robert uh, probably this morning. Okay, the standard one. <coughs> okay, um, that's that's what's happening in generic uh, alpha equal beta equal one uh, case. Now, if alpha is different from beta, uh, you see that this equation becomes uh, is no longer a constraint. It becomes the propagation equation for the trace, right? And so the trace propagates. So uh, H propagates, and so you are you don't have this constraint, so you st you stick with six degrees of freedom. <clears throat> and in, in this case, you can show uh, that in fact one of these degrees of freedom. So you have one more scalar here, and one of these degrees of freedom is a ghost. It has negative energy. So this is um, why uh, one should not consider this theory as, a, as a, you know, relevant for physics. Okay, and there is a last uh, interesting case to be discussed here. Um, uh, which is in the first Pauli class. So if I, if I look at the first Pauli, alpha equal beta equal one, uh, first Pauli, but I uh, now uh, look at the case where this uh, vanishes identically, right? And so I demand that uh, 2m, uh, 3, uh, 3m square is equal to 2 lambda. That is, I choose, I choose says, um, the uh, mass of the graviton so that this uh, is true. Uh, then I, I, I lose this constraint, right, obviously. But I found I found something interesting because recall how I obtain I obtain this constraint I obtain this constraint by um, tracing the field equation in mu nu g mu nu uh, so which was found to be box h minus d rho d sigma h rho sigma uh, plus lambda minus three over two m square h which in this case is zero if I choose this uh, condition. And also, uh, then I, I, I also add the derivative of the vector constraint that wa was uh, one half of m square uh, d mu d nu h mu nu minus box h. And then I, I, I just uh, found that if I add those two terms together, right, I, I found that this is identically zero, right? So in this case, right? So I, I find that one half of m square e mu nu g mu nu plus d mu d nu e mu nu is in this case identically zero. So in this, it's only in this case that it's true. Uh, so which tells me that I found a combination of the field equation and their derivative which, which vanishes identically. And hence, there is a gauge symmetry in the theory, right? So this means, this implies that there is a gauge symmetry in this case. Um, okay. 
and I can find the form of the gauge symmetry easily using this information. <coughs> because the field equation uh, comes from varying uh, the action. So I have the variation of this action, of the action, which is given, uh, which gives uh, by definition the, the field equation. Say so I can write something like that. Uh, e mu nu, say delta h mu nu. Uh, this is a generic variation of the of the uh, of the mate of the graviton, right? But I, if I take now delta h mu nu of uh, some specific form uh, of this form, uh, which is just uh, d mu d nu <coughs> plus one half m square g mu nu acting on some scalar function c of x. Uh, by, because of this identity, I get identically zero, right? So this means that this transformation is a gauge is a gauge symmetry. So uh, this gauge symmetry kills now uh, kills two two degrees of freedom. And I get now I, I, I went I went I go from six to four degrees of freedom. So it's a, it's a case uh, which is called uh, partially massless. So it, it's so called partially massless graviton. That is to say, it's a graviton with uh, you know which which has less degrees of freedom than a generic graviton. Mass massive graviton, but more than a, than a massless graviton. And it was first uh, discovered, I guess, by Désert and uh, Nepo Meshi uh, in 1984, and then uh, further discussed by Désert and uh, Waldron in 2001. Okay, so partial masslessness appears also in other theory like um, higher spin, etc. Okay, so is there a question so far? No? Okay, so how much time do I have? Okay. Um, right, so let me say a few more words about uh, uh, this counting or related issue. Um, so if we now, so what I said so far was um, uh, true for any uh, Einstein spacetime, but one can look at specific case of de Sitter and anti de Sitter, which is uh, usually uh, where, uh, in fact, this is uh, discussed. <coughs> And then um, something interesting is happening, um, in particular uh, on, uh, if you are on the sitter here. Uh, it was shown by Iguchi uh, in, uh, in 1987, I think. Yes. Uh, that um, when you, so you see this partial massless uh, case, right, which was m square. Uh, is um, three lambda, I think, or was it the opposite um, convention? I'm not sure. Uh, no, this was yeah, the opposite. Two lambda is three m square. Yes. Okay. So it can obviously occur only if lambda is positive, right? So on the, if you are on maximally symmetric spacetime, it can only appear for the sitter spacetime. And so when you are on two-seater spacetime and when you cross this, uh, this point, which is sometimes also called the Iguchi point, you, um, uh, you, the, 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 kinet the kinetic, uh, the, the sign of, of one of the scalar mode, in fact, of the graviton, changes sign. So it, it vanishes somehow at this point, and it changes sign when you cross this point. So when you are below this point, so when uh, m square is below uh, two thirds of lambda, in fact, you have a loss of unitarity. So you have a ghost on the sitter. And when m square is uh, bigger, you have uh, you, you don't have a ghost, right? You have no ghost. 
you still have, in all cases, five degrees of freedom, but um, you have this difference, which does not occur on anti -deciter. On anti -deciter, the theory is uh, unitary everywhere. Okay. <coughs> so let me uh, now... Question, yeah? I will discuss this later, yes. That is a good question. Um, okay, so um, now let me uh, do something a little bit different, which is uh, discuss this counting, which I did in the Lagrangian sense here. Uh, if, I, if I would do it uh, in the Hamiltonian sense, this is also interesting, and it plays a role for uh, uh, something I'm going to discuss in the third lecture. So I'm not going to do the full Hamiltonian here, uh, but I'm just going to give you the form of this mass term. So uh, if I consider the uh, mass term uh, 2, 1, 2, uh, I can, uh, and I do a space uh, time split. So my convention is 0 is, will be time, and I, Latin index, will be space. And I just want uh, ij, etc. Right? I just want to decompose um, uh, the mass term, which I introduce in this equation. So this mass term it reads as follows here, using uh, this decomposition. Uh, so there is uh, an alpha minus beta coefficient here, multiplying h not not square. Then there is alpha h uh, ij h i j minus 2 alpha h not i h not i uh, minus uh, beta h i i h j j and plus 2 beta h uh, i i h not not so uh, you see what is special to First Pauli is, uh, is that for First Pauli, this coefficient vanishes, right? So for First Pauli, this is 0 for First Pauli. <coughs> uh, and that's why, in this case, you, you get uh, less degree of freedom, because um, in gen general, right, uh, the propagating, so since the kinetic term of this theory is the same as in general relativity, uh, the, the propagating degrees of freedom are expected to be the Hij, right? Hij should be the propagating uh, degrees of freedom uh, as in general relativity, uh, because this is the one which have uh, kinetic, non-trivial kinetic terms in the kinetic part, which I didn't write here. While uh, H not I and H not not don't have kinetic uh, terms, right? They are, uh, they, they, they are non-propagating degrees of freedom. But you see what's ha happening in this theory is that uh, while for H not I, you always have a, kinet uh, a quadratic term, at least if alpha is non-zero here. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, basically, the equation of motion of H not I will uh, be just... Uh, uh, will just be given, will just give you h not i as a function of the other field, right? Because it's, it's always quadratic here. For h not not, it's not always the case. If you are in the first Pauli case, you don't have this quadratic term here. So everything becomes, in fact, linear into h not not here, including the kinetic term. And so uh, when you are in this case, the uh, field equation for h not not. Uh, generate, uh, generate a constraint on, on the propagating field. So which, in fact, you can get, it is uh, this uh, constraint here, when you work out, when you include also the kinetic part. And so, uh, so in this case, it removes one of the six propagating degrees of freedom. So that's why in the Hamiltonian sense, if you want, uh, you, you, you get this counting out of first Pauli theory. Right? 
Okay. Um, there seen from the perspective of the uh, Hamiltonian counting. Okay, so then um, that's all for counting. And I, I'm going to turn to a, a new question, which is related, in fact, to Robert's question. Uh, and this is the so-called uh, Van Damme Velman Sakharov discontinuity. which uh, was believed to be uh, an obstacle to build a theory of a massive graviton. So far, we have not encountered an obstacle. But so this was discussed for the first time by Van Damme, uh, Veltman, uh, in, a, in a nuclear physics B paper of 1970, uh, and at the same, the same year also by Sakharov. Uh, in a GATP letter. And uh, although his name was forgotten from the abbreviation, there is also a paper of Iwasaki, the same year, on uh, this subject as well. And so um, the issue is um, uh, what is the limit of this massive gravity theory, at least the first Pauli theory, the one which is consistent, uh, when we let m goes to zero. And so as the uh, acronym indicates, or the name indicates, uh, well, the, it turns out that this limit is discontinuous. That is to say, you don't recover general relativity when you let m goes to zero, at least if you are on flat space time. So here, let's restrict ourselves uh, to, uh, to first Pauli to first Pauli on a Minkowski on a Minkowski background uh, G mu nu equal eta mu nu and so uh, we can use the preceding equation right in this case so in this case uh, we had the um, uh, scalar constraint uh, the scalar constraint which was 2, uh, two uh, one three. Uh, reads in this case H. So if I if I am not in vacuum now, I, I consider the case uh, I consider a source. So I can solve algebraically uh, uh, H as a function as an algebraic expression of the source of this form, right? And we still have um, uh, we still have uh, uh, d mu of H mu. Uh, now is zero, right? Because you recall that d mu, uh, maybe I skip this part, d mu of h mu was um, given by the vector constraint uh, being uh, d mu of h, but he, if h is zero, now we have that um, uh, d mu of h mu is zero, so that the graviton is, is transverse, uh, and in vacuum it is also traceless, right? Okay, so we can use this uh, equation, right? to insert this equation into the field equation. So uh, if we insert this uh, into the field equation, uh, of uh, which were 2, 1, 4, uh, I get that the graviton obey the following equation, 1 half of uh, box minus m square h mu nu. Uh, is just now uh, 1 over m Planck square t mu nu minus 1 third of t eta mu nu. And then there is a, a, a second part, which is this, this one. Okay. So uh, first of all, from this equation, I, I can read also that in vacuum, I just have, uh, you know, a Klein-Gordon equation for all the components of the graviton with mass m square. I mean, mass square m square, right? As I would um, expect somehow. But also, I can get uh, now I can get easily uh, the propagator for the graviton. 
So if I use a Fourier decomposition, so let's uh, define uh, ec, a four, my Fourier transform in this way, right? Standard decomposition, right? H at mu of uh, kero. Uh, and then I have that H at uh, mu nu is given by some propagator that I'm going to show the expression of uh, contracted with the source. And let, let me put here an m different of zero to uh, recall that I'm, I'm, I'm in the case where m is non-zero. Uh, then out of, uh, out of uh, this field equation that I wrote on the board, I can easily find this propagator. And this propagator has the following form. <coughs> so it is, uh, so there is one over k square plus m square. And this multiply this structure here. So, uh, the interesting uh, things, so uh, yes, I can call this equation here, uh, this is my 2, 3, 1 equation, and this propagator will be, when m is, so is non-zero, will be a 2, 3, 2 equation. And um, I can compare this propagator to the uh, massless propagator, propagator of a massless graviton. So, uh, this hat uh, mu new rho sigma, the one of general relativity, say. Uh, so it will be now one over k square. Uh, and then I have the same tensoral structure here, except coefficients are different, at least for one term. And then there is a term which I will not write, which will depend on the gauge and the momenta. Uh, but what matters for us is, uh, is that, you see, here you have two thirds versus uh, one here. And, uh, and this two thirds is completely independent of the mass of the graviton. So, so if I take this uh, propagator somehow and I let m goes to zero, so this goes smoothly to one over k square. But this uh, never go to uh, minus one, right? And this is uh, the origin of the, this discontinuity. Um, so to see the effect of this difference, uh, one can do various things. So one thing, is, one, thing one can do <coughs> is uh, to compute uh, formal amplitude somehow between um, conserved currents. So let me consider S mu nu of x and T mu nu of x, uh, conserved energy momentum tensor in this background. And then I just, uh, I just want to compute uh, an amplitude, some amplitude, which is uh, some formal integral, if you want, uh, over space time of uh, the interaction between S and an H mu nu, which is generated by the current T at position X. Right, so H mu nu of T uh, at position X is, uh, is given by an MP minus two uh, integral over X prime of the propagator D uh, mu nu rho sigma uh, of x minus x prime uh, t uh, rho sigma of x prime. Then, uh, if I use the Fourier uh, decomposition uh, here, I find that the amplitude 
uh, are given in the two cases. So in the um, uh, massless case, where this zero here, zero indicates that uh, lambda, the cosmological constant, uh, is zero. <coughs> because later I will show you the same amplitude with a non-zero lambda. So let's uh, keep this zero here. And so and th this, is, this is for the massless case. So the massless amplitude is given by mp minus 2 integral uh, d4k, uh, 2 over k square. And then there is an s hat uh, mu nu t mu nu minus 1 half of s hat t hat, where this is the Fourier transform of the, of the current, right? And uh, so this one half uh, come from this guy here, right? And now in the massive case, uh, I find uh, the following result. Uh, so I have a D4K, uh, 2 over K square plus M square, S at mu nu, T mu nu, minus one third now of S at at. So, uh, so you see that this amplitude, uh, you know, doesn't go to the first one if uh, m square, if m uh, is, is, is let uh, to go to zero, which is this discontinuity. Um, so a physical uh, manifestation of that is the following. This one, one is the following. Uh, imagine you consider the interaction of uh, non-relativistic sources and probe. So uh, we consider now that uh, we have non-relativistic T hat mu nu and S hat mu nu. So uh, with, um, you know, with, uh, say, uh, energy momentum tensor that, to simplify, I can put in this form. Uh, and S at mu nu is also put in this form with, with uh, say, masses, I mean, in the Fourier sense, right? Um, so then I, I find here, from this formula, I find that the amplitude in the uh, uh, non So if I can, I can call this uh, amplitude now with NR, NR, to indicate that it's amplitude between non relativistic sources and probe. Uh, so when I let M goes to zero in the massive case, I find that the, uh, massive mass, uh, the massive amplitude is four thirds of the massless amplitude. Zero, m equals zero. And it is also four thirds of mp minus two, uh, d4k, uh, m watt, m at one, m two uh, at over k square. Um, so, Again, we, one C is different, you see here, right, between the two. But uh, it tells us also that the, the force, if I, if I think in terms of a force, that the force exerted in the massive theory, right, uh, which is in, in this side, if you want, is, is larger by a factor four third. If I, if I just take the same parameter in the actions everywhere, it would be larger by a factor four third than the force exerted by the massless theory. And so this I can understand as being due to the presence of this scalar polarization in addition to the usual ones, which is coupled uh, to the trace of the energy momentum tensor, and which is uh, coupled in a, in a way which is independent of the mass. So it, it stays there if I let the mass goes to zero. That's why I have this factor four third. So you can say, okay, I don't care about this factor after all because I measure the force uh, by Cavendish experiments, and that's how I, I will define my Newton constant. So, and so I can say, okay, I, I now I redefine my Newton constant in the mass, in the massive theory uh, by, by a factor three fourths uh, with respect to the one of the massless theory in order that the force agree, right? Um, but if you do that, then uh, in fact, what, uh, would what would differ is now uh, the, the force or the interaction between, say, a, relative, a non relativistic source and a relativistic probe, right? Because uh, a relativistic probe 
uh, would have a vanishing uh, trace of uh, its energy momentum tensor. So this S hat is, is a trace, so it will be zero. And you see that if you just stick now uh, to the you know, trace less part, I mean, to, to the, to the uh, first part here, uh, those two amplitudes agree now. But if you have redefined your Newton constant so that the uh, first amplitude here uh, agree between the two theories, then these two, these two amplitudes would disagree, right? And they would disagree by a factor of 25%, which is uh, much uh, too large to be acceptable because we test, of course, uh, the interaction of a relativistic probe and a non-relativistic uh, source in the solar system via light bending, right? So light bending, for example, but also other tests in the solar system uh, would uh, kill uh, this theory um, because of this effect, right? Because this light bending would differ in the two theory by 25%. So how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay, very good. Ah, this is perfect, okay. Uh, so uh, one has to, and this, this was uh, supposed, this was, uh, I mean, understood before. I mean, this was thought to be uh, completely uh, the end of the story because he tells us apparently that if one linearize, uh, or if one consider a linear theory of a massive graviton, which, you know, for general relativity is okay in the solar system, and for a lot of observable in the solar system, you just need to linearize gravity. Uh, and if you do the same here in this massive gravity, you, you find something which is completely in disagreement with observations. So one has to find a way out of this conclusion, which will be discussed next time. So before doing that, let me um, discuss a little bit of uh, what's going on to answer maybe Robert's question. Uh, when the background is now not Minkowski, but um, uh, an Einstein spacetime, which is uh, which has non-zero lambda, and which is maximally symmetric. So now consider the same amplitude uh, for uh, G mu nu, which is uh, parameterizing a uh, de-sitter, or uh, an anti de sitter with non-zero lambda. Uh, so one finds in this case that this amplitude is given by the following expression. <clears throat> so there is still this m p minus two in front, um, <clears throat> and this multiplies this following expression. So there is a two. Uh, there is an s mu here, uh, and I will explain my notation. Um, then there is uh, there is this another term. Uh, maybe I should write it down. Sorry. So there is a trace part. So this, this uh, delta L is a uh, is, uh, so-called Lichnerovitz operator. Uh, which the um, def exact definition doesn't matter for us here, but it's just a Laplacian acting on symmetric tensor, which keeps uh, derivative symmetric somehow. But you see, it does not depend on the mass of the graviton. Um, and uh, the dependence on, on the mass is, is, of course, here. But this is okay if I let m goes to zero. This was also the same in the previous amplitude. Um, and the interesting part is here, right? So you see here what's going on is that now if I if I assume that lambda is different of zero and I let m goes to zero, this goes to zero, right? Now smoothly, right? This goes to zero, and I'm left is, with one half which is a re result of uh, general relativity. 
which are also, because in fact, this amplitude are also valid if I let, if I just set m to zero, so I, I see that general relativity is given this one half here, right? And you see what happened previously, previously is that uh, when lambda is zero, this expression are also valid. When lambda is zero, now I have a pure number here, because I have m squared canceling this m squared, and that's why I have a discontinuity, right? So the conclusion is that, uh, in fact, there is no uh, VDVZ discontinuity. Uh, on uh, either de sitter, in fact, or anti de sitter space time. And this was uh, discussed for the first time, I guess, by Iguchi in 1987, and then by Kogan. Uh, Mus um, Lopoulos and Papazoglou in 2001. And the same year, there is also a very nice paper of Massimo Porati uh, in 2001, where in fact you can find uh, similar expressions here. Okay, so um, yes, so I'm, it's a good place to finish, I guess. And um, maybe have some question. Why do you say that? I mean, here it's not really uh, composite. No, but you open up the possibility of, of this one step that you can have the massless ones, you cannot have that. But there's no go to With the massive ones, there's no way you So maybe I will talk about that uh, in the last lecture, yes. I, so far, I, you know, I understand that I, I didn't really discuss, I just wanted to discuss some uh, abstract property, if you want. I didn't, I didn't uh, discuss applications of this uh, type of theories, and I hope I have time to discuss a little bit of it in the last lecture tomorrow, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, yeah, the, up, up to recently, uh, it was not known how to formulate a theory of a massive graviton on a background which is not Einstein. There was no known theory doing that, and um, uh, in fact, I think we 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 were the first one to uh, get this theory. Uh, Two years ago, maybe with my student Laura Bernard and um, uh, Michael von Strauss, and um, also another paper with Angnis Schmidt May, using uh, this so-called DRGT theory. So, so the thing is that one has to modify. So you see, on on Einstein space-time, the mass term is uh, still very simple, right? It's still something like 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 this, right? Uh, and this is uh, true for Einstein space-time. Uh, as, as I showed here, because it, it has a correct counting and it's known for a long time. But when you go to non-Einstein spacetime, to generic spacetime, um, in fact, you lose. You, if you do, you have to modify this mass term, and you have to modify it with curvature-dependent terms. So, with, in fact, it, the, our construction is, is very uh, complicated. I mean, it has very complicated structure, but it's necessary uh, in order to get. The equivalent of this uh, of this scalar constraint. Uh, so if you don't uh, have all these terms which depend on the curvature, so there will be terms uh, con con I mean containing the Ricci uh, up to Ricci uh, cube, uh, which are contracted together and with H, 
and this modifies this master in a specific way in order to get uh, this scalar constraint. Otherwise, you don't get it. So I don't think, uh, maybe I'll have time to show a little bit of this tomorrow, but I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, at least this was not known until recently. Some people try to construct this master in string theory, in fact, this curvature uh, coupling, but they, could, they just got one, one term. But in fact, this very complicated structure uh, could not have been guessed if one had not discovered before this uh, so-called DRGT theory. Yeah.